Well you can see just behind Ori, the wheelchair racers were getting ready to start this on the, the blue start. There are three starts, the blue, the red, the green, and they all come together eventually. But here in the blue start, the, uh, the elite women's and men's wheelchair racers. There is Susanna Scaroni, the American who finished third in Tokyo and Boston behind Manuela Shah and uh, Amanda McGrory. OK, One let's welcome from the left, from the USA, with the best of 138, 17. Susanna Scaroni. Different courses have huge effects in wheelchair racing, in particular in marathons. See Jay Jones behind there. Uh, Tani alongside, alongside her, twice very the well champion indeed, here in we'll London, from see if she USA, Amanda post a decent McGrory. Time today. Amanda McGrory, though, uh, lost out to Manuela Shah in Boston, but had got the better of the Swiss athlete in Tokyo in, in a field, photo Carl finish. World and there is Manuela Shah the with the, champion, the previously dominant Tatiana McFadden missing Tokyo and struggling in Boston with those blood clots. So Shah has been the athlete to the beat. Men, he was undefeated in 2016. It's the Paralympic champion from And there is the man to beat Marcel in the men's wheelchair race. Marcel Hoog, 31 years old now, the uh, Swiss athlete. It was in David Weir's shadow Twice for the a while, but from Australia, the tables Kurt have turned. Kurt Fernley, the Australian, second here last year, twice a winner and before finally, that. finally, six times the London champion. And there will be some noise for, for this London man. 2012 Paralympic golds from Great Britain, David Weir. This is 18th Stand London marathon, six times race. a winner. Magical four golds in the Paralympics in London, but uh, last year finished third here and struggled in Rio, didn't finish the marathon. What can he achieve here? I see Helen Glover, Her Heather Stanning getting them underway. And uh, Tani Gray Thompson, we've been chatting a lot about the sort of vagaries, the difficulties of this course, so different to Boston, which they raced recently, which actually for wheelchair racers is a very, very quick course. This can be fiddly at times. The London Marathon course is quite twisty and turny. The profile uh, drops in the first 10K, which is, is quite fast. But quite early on into the race, you start hitting the roundabouts. Uh, there's speed ramps on the road in the first mile and a half. And we've got a really big pack of men on the right-hand side. Uh, you know, everyone wants to try and jump in the draft because it makes such an advantage. Marcel Hoog's taking it out because he will want to be controlling the race. Kurt Fernley in second. And David Weir just needs to, to run a smart race. He doesn't want to do too much of the front because he wants to conserve his energy. It's so, so different to the, uh, the other races we'll see today in terms of how you recover as well. People will say, well, my goodness, they raced in Boston Monday and they're racing again here. But it's a very different thing. You, you put in the efforts throughout the course, but you do have time to, to rest as well during the course. We'll just run through the uh, some of the main runners and riders for you here and look down the course. We're talking about the three starts. They have the blue start, the red start, the green start that all converge eventually. But these are the uh, some of the main contenders in the men's race. And this is how they stand. They've got the World Parathletics Marathon World Cup. Marcel Hoog is the favorite uh, in this uh, today. Ernest Van Dyke, very strong though, the South African as well. Look out for a very strong Japanese contingent. Uh, Yamamoto may well be up there, but uh, Watanabe, as well the women's race and it's all changed without Tatiana McFadden because she's won the last four here and uh, so without her Manuela Shah is certainly the athlete to look out for. Well McGrory and Scaroni are uh, trained together they're both from the University of Illinois so they might be well working together and trying to protect each other a little bit but between the men's and the women's race there is no drafting so we saw the women on the left hand side it looks like they're settling down into a very different race they're not trying to jump into the men's pack but uh, around these bends uh, when it starts bunching up you you have to be really careful because there's not a lot of space they're probably pushing about 18 19 miles an hour at the moment so you have to be really careful that you don't kind of clip any of the curbs along the way but Marcel Hug is looking very comfortable at the moment and uh, just in the green chair behind you can see Britain's uh, Simon Lawson who had a fantastic Boston Marathon on Monday and did a huge personal best uh, and is now the fastest Britain well, it's interesting to talk about Simon Lawson there because he is a, a T53 racer, which means that he would be slightly more impeded than T54s. But there's also a T51-52 race taking place, and the two dominant figures in that are Ray Martin and uh, Santiago Sanz, so uh, look out for them. They have uh, slightly less function than the T53, T54s, Danny. Yeah, the 52s uh, have very limited hand function, and so they'll be posting slow times. They also push very differently to the men's 53 or 54 who, uh, who have stomach function and, and have full chest function. 
but uh, it's it's looking a big pack of uh, of athletes at the moment. Uh, Simon Lawson's looking a good position, and and Dave Weir tucking in in third place, just looking very comfortable at the moment. This is a very good view to see the techniques involved, Tani, to see the uh, the. Uh the chairs that they use as well because these are high spec but also who be able to look around and then just uh, you put in a few little punches and then you can you can sit up you can look around you can and, and as you said in the first 5k there's a, there's in fact a very steep downhill section from Woolwich down towards the Thames at about uh, 5k where you can build up some huge speed yeah it's sort of uh, down shooters hill they can be going at sort of 35 40 miles an hour but Marcel's just having a look around seeing how big the pack is this is probably the biggest men's pack we've had in London Marathon uh, for probably the last eight or nine years so uh, you know it, it's kind of interesting that there's already this number of people who are staying together and uh, on the left hand side uh, we've got Heinz Frey uh, from Switzerland he wants to be nearer the front just because uh, he's a higher level athlete and uh, oh this is a this is always a, a difficult part of the course. I, I drew breath there because if you're drafting behind people, you can't see which way people are moving. You aren't necessarily going to see uh, where some of those uh, barriers in the road are. Well, they went through a mile in about 3.30, so off they go to deal with all this sort of road furniture there, the uh, speed bumps and the traffic islands, and we'll head back to the start. Because also taking place here today, we've got the IPC Marathon World Cup races, uh, different categories. You've got T11, 12, men and women. And again, we'll explain these T13 men, T45, 46 men. We've seen the T51, 52 wheelchair races out there, but away they go here. And uh, in the wheelchair race, you've got Marcel Hugo, who's one of three reigning World Parathletics Marathon World Cup champions, who is back to defend their crowns. But also, here you have T11, T12 for para-athletes with a severe visual impairment. They run with guides. Uh, that's a race for men and women. T13 para-athletes with, with a visual impairment who meet the minimum criteria, so not running with a guide. T45, 46 are for para-athletes with lower and upper arm impairments. So these are all the athletes who are running here. And obviously they have to have very, very good guide runners who they do all the training with as well. And again, a very strong Japanese contingent here today in London. So off they go in the uh, in the World Para Athletics Marathon World Cup. And uh, well, this is the T11, T12 start list. And again, Hirokoshi and Kumagai of Japan will certainly be contenders there. And we go down to the second page as well. It's a, it's a, it's a huge contingent over from Japan. And uh, in the T13, just a couple, Tim Prendergast, who's been based over here for a while, goes for New Zealand. And the T45, 46, as we explained, for the para athletes with lower and upper arm impairments. This is just men, men only in this category. No women running in this category today. And Derek Ray goes for Great Britain. So head back out to the wheelchair races, and again, a reminder, you might be watching the London Marathon for the, the first time, but uh, they are pretty far east. They start in Greenwich, and then they head further east, as uh, Tanya was saying, Shooters Hill, and out towards Woolwich, and then they come down towards the Thames and head back west, and uh, uh, then they're still on the south side of the Thames, then they eventually will cross, cross at about the halfway stage at Tower Bridge, then go back out towards Canary Wharf, and then back uh, down the embankment towards uh, Buckingham Palace and home. But uh, I say Marcel Hugo took them out. But the best way to think about this, Tani, is not perhaps in terms of uh, standard marathons, but in terms of cycling races, because that's how it works. It works with packs, it works with drafting, it works with athletes working off each other. It's it's much more similar to uh, cycling than it is to running, and that's why the athletes can race back to back. You know, most of the field have done Tokyo, the Boston. Uh, they're going to Seoul next week, uh, so the, the recovery is is much quicker because it's about overcoming momentum, not gravity. It doesn't put as much pressure on your body. And if you're sitting in the middle of the pack, uh, and you can just see Dave wearing the the blue top there, uh, he's he's getting a draft. He's conserving lots of energy. Uh, you know, it, it it's a really good place for them to be. The danger at this stage with such a big pack you might get some people who, who go for a do or die move and try to sprint off the front and and run a sort of a brave race it's way too early to be trying to do that at the moment well we talked about David Weir and there'll be a lot of attention on him and uh, well he was certainly feeling pretty confident when we he spoke to us a few days ago I'm just happy to, to be in good shape to, to compete with the guys uh, I don't put that pressure on my shoulders 
I'll wait until the morning and see how I feel. But you know, I'm in pretty good shape, and I'm 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 happy with my performance over the last couple of weeks. I won Paris Marathon. I won it in a good time. Uh, I broke away from the field at 21 miles, so I felt pretty strong, and it gave me a lot of confidence coming into for Sunday's race. David Weir and uh, he's part of this pack that went through the second mile at about 3.48, so slightly slower than the first mile, but again, that's such a difference in the, I was walking the course yesterday, it's a large part of it, and the, just the undulations, which obviously are for, for the runners later on are a bit of a factor, but for the wheelchair racers, that is exaggerated uh, tenfold. Yeah, I mean, all the guys talk about uh, the wheelchair race just being a series of sprints joined up together because you, you're having to turn around the bends, you know, the up and down of the course, you're constantly kicking. Now, you can see now, as we're getting to a faster bit of the course, uh, Just Cassidy on the left-hand side, who's got really bright wheels, he's always great to pick out in a pack, they'll, they'll want to be at the front because when the guys start kicking, it, it takes a time for it to filter to the back of the pack. And you can see now they're coasting down the hill. They're probably hitting 30 miles an hour at the moment. It, you, you can't quite see the speed, but this is where it starts getting interesting because of having to come around the bends and, and maintain the speed. They're splitting up, but the pack will start coming back together again. This is why you work and you work in coaching a lot. So much is about aerodynamics. You think of a time trialist on a, on a bike and it's about long and it's about low and it's about narrow as well. And they do so much work on the aerodynamics. Their aerodynamics are, are huge, and you see they're all trying to tuck down and, and not lift their head too much. Um, it, it's always a, a potentially dangerous part of the course because if you're not looking where you're going, you can hit a little bump. And at this speed, even hitting a stone on the road will, will take you out of the chair. And it's also learning not to panic at this point in the race. It, it's be, because you will make that distance back up. Uh, but it's interesting to see how the, the Japanese athletes are all racing. They're slightly racing as a team at the moment. Um, I would have expected to see Ernst van Dijk uh, and Kurt Fernley a bit nearer the front, uh, but you know they might still have a little bit of uh, lactic in their, their arms from the weekend, and they're not being too brave at the moment. Well, it's interesting, though. You were saying before the race that uh, uh, one of the groups that would not be afraid of the downhill section were the Japanese athletes, and it was Hiroyuki Yamamoto who was leading them down there. Down, so they've had that little bit of a breather there down the hill, round the roundabout, so they're a bit closer to the Thames now, but Yamamoto's still uh, leading them out at the moment, but uh, they will close up. The pack will come together as they head deeper into the course. women a lot of people will recognize a very familiar face of elite athlete Joe Pavey the 43 year old former European champion is one of a real group of talented British women looking for qualification for the world championships in August in London and we caught up with her a couple of days ago Joe, we haven't seen you for a little while. How have you been? Yeah, all right. Just putting in the training, um, keeping it going, and having this focus of the London Marathon has really kept me motivated, wanting to put in the miles. And I've really enjoyed the change in emphasis, really, but really looking forward to it. When did you sort of make the decision? Was it after Rio? Or, you know, I presume 2017 London World Championships was something you just didn't want to miss. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd really love to try and compete in London 2017, a world champs on home soil. It'd be such an amazing opportunity and obviously fond memories of London 2012 and knowing what that home crowd feels like. So definitely that's a motivation. And the marathon, even though I've done a couple, it did feel like a new challenge, something that would really keep my motivation going and just such fond memories of competing in it before and just really wanting to give it another go. Joe Pavey there, debut marathon. My first marathon, which was the London Marathon, I definitely learnt the hard way. People had told me, oh, you've got to pace yourself, you know, it's so important. And I was like thinking, yeah, yeah, I thought I was listening. But as soon as the gun went off, I just went for it. I really wanted to try and be competitive and I wasn't ready to be up with those top girls. And I definitely felt like the last 40 minutes of the race, I felt quite delirious, just trying to push myself to that finishing line, thinking that I ran this really badly. You're still a bit of a novice at the marathon, so you're, how do you approach that? I'm getting older now, but I still think the marathon is an event where potentially I could get a PB. The build-up I've had has been consistent. I've trained really hard. The one thing I'd say is I've had a lot more illness than I would have liked, but I think any busy parent can relate to that, the little ones bringing home the bugs. No build-up is ever perfect for any runner. I think it's just dealing with the ups and downs is what you have to do, really. 
There she is. She's run it before, of course, but she thinks she's got a PB in her today. And she might need to produce that if she's going to qualify for those world championships because there are some strong British women out there. And to explain that battle of Britain and also uh, tell us uh, where the elite race is going to be won, we can now join our commentary team of Paula Radcliffe, Steve Cram. And Steve, I have to say, and normally I would, of course, uh, introduce you last, but for the very last time, I'm going to say welcome to Brendan Foster. This is his final and 37th London Marathon. Uh, an emotional day for all of us, Steve. Yes, there's already a tear welling up in uh, the commentary box in uh, all of our eyes. <laughs> Uh, we'll go home and have a little bit of fun because with uh, Brendan over the years, it's been nothing more than a huge, uh, certainly for me anyway, massive uh, privilege and uh, really have enjoyed having him alongside me for so many years. But of course, he was here long before I came into this commentary box. So um, we'll talk more about Brendan uh, during the morning and uh, I'll introduce him in just a moment before. First of all, though, he would think it only right that we go through this uh, elite field and fitting tribute to Brendan it's probably the greatest certainly the women's race probably the greatest women's field we've ever had gathered you saw Joe Pavey there and Gabby was right Joe's got a contest on her hand for the uh, British quest to get into the team for the world championships and many other athletes doing the same here but these are the ones who may well be contending or will be contending to win the London Marathon. Mary Catani, who's done so it before there. We'll Mary de Barba, the world champion, and some great names from the track, Tiranesh de Barba, and Vivian Chariot running her first one. They, those are the British athletes there. Ali Dixon, who represented us in Rio last year. Charlotte Perdue looking to get onto the team, do what she didn't manage to do last year. She perhaps is the favorite amongst the British contingent, but more of that story as well. So let's go through them individually, the main contenders. I said this is her first ever marathon, the Olympic champion over 5,000 metres, multiple world champion on the track, Vivian Chariot. Racing here in London, the city she's described as her second home. Well, Tufa knows how to win the London Marathon, did it in 2015, second last year. The favourite, though, will be Mary Catani, two-time winner of this event, coming back into some really good form in 2017. The world champion from 2015, Mare de Baba, Ethiopia's first ever world marathon champion. That's a surprising fact, isn't it? Considering they've had the likes of Tiranesh de Baba to cheer over the years, just still really getting the grips with the marathon event. And Susan we talked about this British battle that we're going to follow Pavey. all day. Charlotte Perdue, Ali Dixon, Susan Partridge, Joe Pavey, one or two others to watch out for as well. So we'll keep you well informed, of course, right through the next two and a half hours or so. So here they go then. The 2017 Elite Women's Field ready to go. A countdown to what we hope will be a classic race. Our two Olympic heroes look down on this stellar field as they head off on their own private little quest, of course. The elite women get the roads all to themselves. Pacemakers wearing the uh, black and white stripes of Shaftesbury Harriers and for those who perhaps don't know that that is the uh, club strip of Shaftesbury Harriers and think it's actually um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at him already and not in a wink towards um, the great Newcastle United supporter and going to be sitting here for the final time of the London Marathon Brendan Foster good morning Brendan good morning Steve and I wasn't going to mention the football this early I seriously wasn't but I was looking forward to mentioning it later on because things are changing in the football world in the northeast and i'm sure a comment later but this is a significant event these days this is a great field one of the best fields we've ever seen here in london and a race real race here will unfold but women take the center stage and that's absolutely the right thing wonderful to see and paula you must feel the same 
Yeah, I'm looking out here and I'm looking at perfect conditions for, for marathon running. Perfect temperature, hardly a breath of wind. The sun's already out on Backheath and it's starting to peek through here at, at the finish on the Mall. And they've got absolutely perfect conditions. They're all here in great shape and it's a great place to, to come and run and know that you're in shape. Go out there and absorb the atmosphere all along the route, all along the routes today and I remember my dad back in when I did my first run in 2002 telling me you get into the Isle of Dogs and there's nobody there you've got to really keep your focus and it's packed today there will not be one quiet spot for any of these runners out of there well I said it's one of the greatest fields it's full of world champions it's full of world record holders on the track it's full of Olympic champions but of course the world record holder is sitting here I've just been listening to her but Mary Katani and others are going to be chasing Oh, they hold a quick time today and it sometimes can be a bit confusing I know for those who aren't aficionados but there is a, a world record for the a women's only race which is also held by Paula Radcliffe apart from the world the fastest time ever run and that's 2.17.42 which is kind of the target today uh, but I think most of all they're going to be interested in winning this year's London Marathon right an update on the uh, wheelchairs Andrew Just a little bit, a few gaps were appearing for a moment, but uh, things as we expected will close together. We got last year uh, the fantastic finish. In fact, the top 10 athletes were separated by just a, a few seconds or so, and we expect Tani to be pretty much the same again in the men's race. Again, just a few uh, say bits of road furniture to deal with, and you get an idea as well of the twisting, turning nature of the course. As they come around Kadisar, which in kilometres is about 10 kilometres, just beyond six miles or so, but uh, all the likely contenders are still up there, Tani. This is the, the biggest pack we've had for a number of years. There's about 25 wheelchair races uh, together. And, and Cutty Sock's the real challenge because you, you lose a lot of speed. There's speed ramps, there's little drops in, up and down. And the road surface isn't always that good either. So potholes in the road, you can sort of move the pack around. You see athletes, they, they're starting to spread out because, again, like cycling, you come really wide to get around the bend. Uh, and it's uh, an interesting, um, it's, 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 it's looking really good at the moment for the number of guys who are there. Yeah, we've got 18, the top 18, ignore those two you saw there just a moment ago, but you've got 18 really who are a little bit clear of the rest. And as I say, all the likely contenders are up there, David Weir and uh, Marcel Hook and Kurt Fernley and Van Dyke of South Africa as well, back in the women's field, which is slightly smaller, and uh, we expect to see Manuela Shah winning this. She's a clearer favorite than we have in the, uh, in the men's event, but uh, we'll update you once again with the wheelchair racers uh, a little bit later on. So early stages of the elite women's race with uh, Florence Kiplagat already gone to the front. Just to try and um, elaborate uh, quickly on the, on the uh, British women, there, there are three places available. Most of the women in the field today uh, to be in contention have already got the qualifying time for the World Championships. So it really is a case of the top three. Joe Pavey will be hoping that she can get in there with. Obviously, Charlotte Perdue, Ali Dixon, perhaps the two favourites, if you like. And uh, But we will be trying to obviously keep an eye on how that goes. Charlotte Perdue is rumoured, in fact, I'm chatting to Charlie over the last couple of days, she seems very relaxed. The diminutive figure there, the blonde hair at the back, Susan Partridge, a taller one, closer to us. Joe Pavey, and then Ali Dixon, the Sunland stroller, and uh, uh, Tracy Norman over on the far side as well. So we've got four or five at least who will be hoping that this is their day today. Charlotte Arter is going to be pacing another British athlete over on the far side wearing the black and white. I know, Brendan, you don't think it is, but they're all wearing black shorts as well today because normally it's red, it's black and white stripes and red shorts. And I'm sure it's a, it's just for you, but never mind. You're just egging me on here, Steve. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm going to say it now because things have happened and changed in the Northeast. And last year when Newcastle got relegated, you sent me a text saying, here's the, here's the route to get to Burton Albion. Well, be honest with you, I'm going to return that text to you this <laughs> this year <laughs> and i'm going to tell you that fleetwood are go going well and they may be, you may be visiting fleetwood next season so i've got that out of the way so it's one all now well i look forward to visiting both of those wonderful towns <clears throat> anyway right more of that later and uh, women's elite here of course uh, they've struggled actually the organizers to get 
but when you're going to run at record paces, you know, finding good pacemakers is uh, always difficult. But I think there's enough good women in there. There is one pacemaker for that lead group. There's plenty of them asked to go with the pace, and they will be running at around 2.18 pace, at least a halfway, and then see what happens after that. Well, they've gone through the first mile in 5.15, there, so they're well up on the schedule that they asked for. I mean, often in the first mile, you want to stretch out your legs a little bit as well and see how good people are feeling, get rid of, few, of a few of those nerves, a few of those butterflies, and then settle down into the pace they want to set. But they're just dropping back a little bit, but already Mary Katani is committing herself well at the front. Well, one piece of news which uh, certainly athletic fans will be very much aware of is last year's winner and, of course, the Olympic champion, uh, Jemima Sumgong, not here. And if you remember what happened last year, you can have a, just a little look back. It was a really dramatic race last year. Uh, we had a couple of fallers, in fact, but you may remember that Sumgong herself had a really heavy fall and um, banged her head, actually, and for a little while we thought that might be it for her, but she got up and came on to win the race uh, in a great race and then went on to win, of course, the Olympic title. But about a month ago, was found to have tested positive for EPO. And uh, let's hear the thoughts, first of all, of Joe Pavey on that. I think it's a shame that you've got a win like Jemima and Sun Gong testing positive because they're just ruining the sport. I mean, we're glad that she's been caught. I mean, that's one good thing to say. You had so many years where you didn't really hear about a competition testing happening in Kenya, and the fact that that's happened is a good sign. Um, it is a shame for the sport that there's still people out there cheating the system and ruining the name of our sport, because you want to believe a good performance. You want to be looking at athletes winning Olympics and big events and admire their performance. and people like her are ruining the sport because every time you see a good performance you're wondering oh is that for real or not well as ever pretty strong uh, words from Joe Pavey and I think we should mention Brendan the fact that that positive test was a part of a, a wider testing program that um, the world marathon majors including London Marathon have contributed funding towards um, which resulted in some going in an out of competition test. Uh, we have to say the B sample hasn't been tested yet, but she failed the A sample. But I mean, Joe's right. It's 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 good that they're being caught, but it also does reflect uh, rather poorly uh, again on on uh, elite women's racing and, and particularly on the roads and marathon at the moment. Well, it certainly does, and I and I think that when you look at it, you've you got this young lady from Kenya, Jemima Sung Gong. She's robbed the sport of a fantastic London Marathon last year, which she won. She robbed the sport of that performance in the Olympic Games. And you can't continue taking the goodness out of a sport like this. And the great athletes that we've had from Kenya are all as equally dismayed as we are. And this including Mary Katani there, who's following the pacemaker nicely. But to be honest with you, at least Seb Coe and the new regime in the, in the IAAF are literally going after them in a big way. Thank goodness for that. And let's hope for the future. We can be watching athletics and watching performances, watching athletes like Mary Katani, knowing that there's no cheating going on because you can't continue in a sport where you can't believe what you see. And that, that last point, Bren, about can't believe what you see, unfortunately, that then reflects on, on performances from others. And to be fair, there have been some, you know, we've had a new world record in the half marathon just recently. And inevitably, what that does is it, it people have just point the finger. And now we don't know one way or another, but it, it, it just... You know, it takes the belief system away, doesn't it? Absolutely, and that's what it's all about, is having the credibility there, the credibility for people watching the sport, for parents taking their children down to the tracks to get them involved in the sport, and for the other athletes. They have the right to be able to put in a good performance and have people believe that and show this is the best I can do. Um, what, what we are what's happening when we don't have a good enough testing system in place that all of the cheats are being caught, and when we get more and more people have been caught from the same country i mean we, there's a case to argue now is should kenya have been subject to some kind of ban in the same way that russia was i don't believe it's as institutionalized in kenya but certainly there are fingers pointed at the other kenyan athletes because of what some athletes in kenya have chosen to do and they've chosen to cheat and they've damaged the reputation of their country in doing that but i think the difference there paula is in in russia it's institutionalized cheating in kenya it's random cheating by people people looking for an advantage the great distance running nation of Kenya has got some fantastic athletes and a huge, huge number of them have been legitimate. But when you look at that run last year in the Olympic Games, I described Jemima Sumgong's run there.
there as textbook distance running. And really, what Steve, it wasn't textbook distance running, it was textbook cheating. And I, I'm horrified that that ha actually happened by a great nation being led down by an athlete, Jemima Sungo. So from the uh, women's race, we'll head a little bit further into the course and the elite wheelchair races and uh, the men. Well, it's still a pretty big uh, group which is out in front. I think almost those 18 that we talked about at the last update are out in front. You see Marcel Hoog in second place there, just ahead of David Weir and Kirk Fernley and with the, uh, the vest on. So those are the three big names that we highlighted sitting in second, third and fourth at the moment behind the Japanese racer Yoshida and they're not too far away from uh, crossing the river, getting to the halfway point, and they'll go round the entire course probably in about 1 hour 20, something like that. Uh, the current pace they're going is the men's are looking around 125, although the first half is quicker than the second, so they may well lose a couple of minutes. Jock Cass Just Cassidy from Canada looks like he's uh, deciding to have a bit of a break. He, uh, he's probably decided that he doesn't want that many people in the pack, and. It doesn't look like it's a serious attempt because he's looking over his shoulder uh, and, you know, he hasn't just got his head down. But, you know, Josh is good on the downhills. Uh, he won Boston a couple of years ago, world best time. So he's playing to his strengths at the moment, which is, you know, really important. I'm always trying to adopt that tactic of uh, attempting to hypnotise his rivals with those fields. Just an update on the uh, women's race as well, because the three who we highlighted at the start of Manuela Shah, the favourite, Susanna Scaroni, and Amanda McGrory had uh, broken clear. They've been joined by Marguerite van der Broek as uh, well. So uh, the three that we uh, expected to be contending in the women's are, uh, are clear. Josh Cassidy just having a little bit of a go here, but uh, it's not a breakaway. Again, it's just uh, the, the pack will bring him back in. But we can join the women's race. Well, the news already is that Mary Katani has decided that uh, the pace, that the fast pace that had been asked for, the others are kind of sitting off this, which is um, a little surprising. You could understand Vivian Chariot thinking, OK, my first marathon, I won't go for it. The second mile was a sub five minute mile. It is a quicker mile. Paulo knows that they've they've broken away early and there is my concern for Mary would be there's only one pacemaker here and if she <laughs> feels sorry Paula's for her. Feel sorry for her but she could have a lonely run out there today uh, because she's obviously asked for fast pace she's broken away from the lead pack at a very early stage not even through 5k yet um, but she means business Paula she definitely does I mean this is actually the fast mile now the third mile which is is predominantly downhill um, and you can really make up time on this but she ran 459 for a second mile um, and I think the girls behind are absolutely on the pace they asked for they're on 69 minute pace she's way ahead of that I mean she's ahead of 250 she's ahead of the pace that I ran in 2003 at the moment uh, and she's definitely got the bit between her teeth and is really attacking today and yeah I don't feel too sorry for her I did not get a pacemaker that went past five miles <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of all our yesterdays in this box with Brendan and Paula today anyway um, Mary Katani setting a stall out very early here that's already a 50 meter lead on the rest of this brilliant pack in the 2017 London Marathon. An awful long way to go, though, which is what we always say. <laughs> well, uh, last we saw, Mary was storming ahead, and I have to say, um, certainly the young lady next to me is getting a little bit nervous, but I think Mary Katani just might be overcooking this a little bit. If I told you that she was on about 2.11 pace, which will be probably quicker than any of the British men will run today, which is a bit silly early on. I mean, Mary's a great athlete, knows what she's doing normally, um, but it's gone off at a crazy pace, I think way too fast. And um, we'll have to, have to watch that as we just look at this chasing group. You see Tracy Barlow at the back of that group. Um, I think that is, I'll have to check. No, that, this is actually, no, this is the chasing of the British group a little bit further behind, actually. Uh, the British group are further uh, back. But the British group have started pretty quickly, actually, because they're obviously heading at around theoretically 228 pace, but the British group um, are a bit inside that pace, 17.25 through the first 5K. 
Right, all the way forward. But the gap, as right. Paul, I'm just going to say, Mary Katani is leaving Tierney Barber, Mario de Barber, Vivian Chariot, etc., who are running more sensibly. Is Mary going to pay for this? Surely she must. I really hope so. Um, <laughs> Because this is phenomenally quick to be running. It's even for a half marathon, this is, is close to. I mean, Mary Katani's run very fast for the half marathon. She's run 65.13, um, and she's not far off that pace. And what she will also be seeing on the lead car in front of them, they now see the cumulative time of the run, time that they're running, the last kilometre split, and the predicted finish time. So at one point in this race, she will have seen 2:10:41 pop up on that predicted finish time and if that doesn't make a thing I'm going a little bit too quick either she's in outstanding shape and extremely extremely confident or she hopefully is going a little bit too fast too early in this race she has done that before she did that in New York uh, in the marathon what 2011 I think where she set off on very very fast pace went through in about 67 for the half and then really paid for it in the second half Meanwhile, in the uh, wheelchair races, well, Tower Bridge, the uh, men's wheelchair racers are some way through Tower Bridge now. There was a what we thought was a crucial break at uh, Tower Bridge and beyond, where the three main contenders, of Marcel Hood and David Weir and Kurt Fernley, broke clear. But uh, then they were reeled back in. So this is as it stands now, as they head through Wapping and out towards uh, the Isle of Dogs and... Canary Wharf. So everyone's back together again. There you see Marcel Hood, the favourite, the defending champion, just tucked in behind David Weir and going through Kirk Fernley. And uh, this gap, all still connected, all still in with a chance. This was as they came through Tower Bridge, but they're some way past this now, and uh, they are all still together. We thought that this gap might open up just as they came up the slight incline coming away from Tower Bridge, but eventually they were reeled back in. So further down the course, they are all together again. the crowd don't they and the crowds here are full of anticipation for the start of the men's elite race and the mass is going off in 10 minutes we'll move to bbc one for that you can see the elite men behind me here warming up and amongst them is the man that they all know they have to beat he is a true great of the sport in a world where the word great can be overused or the term legendary athlete questioned Ken Anissa Bekele is deserving of both tributes. He's the stellar name in this year's men's elite field. On the track, the Ethiopian long distance runner was a dominant force. He won three Olympic titles, five world titles, and broke both the 5,000 and 10,000 meters world records. His 2014 transition to the roads brought him victory in his marathon debut in Paris in a course record time. Only just returning from injury this time last year, Bekele still managed to finish third in his London marathon debut. He controversially missed selection for Ethiopia's Olympics team for Rio, only to deliver the perfect response, triumph in the Berlin marathon in the second fastest time ever. Today, he'll have Eliud Kipchoge's course record of two hours, three minutes, five seconds in mind and may even further cement his legend with a new world record under two hours, two minutes and 57 seconds. Only true greats can afford themselves such rarefied opportunity. And that is the word on the street. The Bekele has asked for world record paces today, which is music, no doubt, to the ears of our Bren. Brendan Foster, this is your 37th and final London Marathon. What a way to go out that would be. Are we going to see a world record today? Well, I'll tell you what, I commented on, on Ken Lisa Bekele's first ever international race, which was a cross country in the northeast of England. And at the, at the time, I thought he was going to be great, but I didn't think he was going to be this great. I would love to see him go out today with a, with a run like that. I'm a little bit nervous for him because he's had a few niggles in the last few weeks, but what a way to go. Ken Lisa Bekele, one of the greatest of all time. Could he win London Marathon and could he win it in a world record? We shall see, Brennan. We'll also see some of your great moments over the last 37 years or so when we move to BBC One, which is what we're doing right now. See the race go off, the men's elite and the masses in a few moments' time. We'll see you on BBC One. Well, 
welcome to the 2017 Virgin Money London Marathon, live here from Blackheath. And in five minutes' time, the fastest runners in the world will set off alongside 40,000 men and women of all ages, abilities, shapes and sizes, who will have just one goal in mind, and that is to finish. Today is such a special day, a day which brings so many people together as they push themselves to the limit in this most iconic and magnificent human race. Hi, my name's Tanya. I'm Vincent. Devinda. Thomas. This is my wife, Laura. Sorry, got that wrong. Start again. Am I going? <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, my name is Pepe. I'm from Mexico. Ottawa, Canada. Kent. London. Wakefield. The United States. Liz Avery. I'm 32 and I'm from South Wales. Sorry, I'm a bit overexcited. I'm running for my father, who's uh, unfortunately suffering from pancreatic cancer. The Children with Cancer UK, and it's in memory of my mum. I have a point to prove, having come back from a life-threatening illness. In memory of my dad, who lost a few years ago. I'm running for a premature baby charity. Everything I can do to help, I will do. I'm running because, well, frankly, I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I've always wanted to do. We're going to do all the major marathons. This time last year, I hadn't run more than 5k. People say I'm over the hill and I'm not. Why not do it now? It's now or never. I am an epileptic. I am running just to show that I can do this. I'm running because I'm a type 1 diabetic. Stay healthy, both physically and mentally. Running together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What an awe-inspiring sight that is. Good luck to each and every one of those runners and everyone here today, the 40,000 taking part. They've all got their own reasons to run. The atmosphere will help them along, and so will these guys, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry, who are here to start the race. They are the figureheads of Heads Together, which is the official charity of this year's marathon, which, of course, is aiming to remove the stigma surrounding those suffering from mental health issues. A lot of the runners who are running today will run with the Heads Together bands on their heads and they will of course all have their own charities their own causes which will they will discuss and talk about and we'll hear so many of their stories as the day goes on here at the start though you can see the excitement of the face of the people in the crowds because right behind me here the elite men have lined up Kenanisa Bekele there in the middle, the five-time world champion, three-time Olympic champion who may one run a world record today. Behind him, the masses and masses of runners who, of course, are aiming to complete that 26.2-mile course. And the Royals, who are getting their last-minute briefing on how they start the London Marathon, will hopefully catch up with them a little bit later. We're on air, of course, till 3 o'clock on BBC One. But I'm going to hand you over now to our incredible commentary team of Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson and Andrew Potter, Paula Radcliffe, our Bren, his last ever London marathon. What an emotional day this could be. And of course, Steve Crabb. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Gabby. Good morning, everyone. On this special day, on a most special event. Three starts, one finish, thousands of stories. All of these runners heading towards the red start, coming out of Greenwich Park. This is where the masses will get underway. This is the blue start for the elite athletes, good for age. And then there's a green start with uh, some celebs. Well, you, we could, I can't call them celebs, can we? We can't call the Duke and the Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry celebs, but it's, they've added some real stardust to this year's event. Over 40,000 people registered in the last few days to line up this morning. That is a record. We're expecting a record field in terms of participants. Will we get a world record from our elite men? Well, here is the lineup headed by Kenanisa Bekele, perhaps the greatest ever distance runner, certainly on the track, and now looking to cement that on the roads. Nobody has held a world record for the 5,000, the 10,000, and the marathon. Can he do it? The British quest to make the world championship team another story to watch out for today the world champion there young Gabriel Selassie what a great name that is Gurme Gabriel Selassie they're not highly Gabriel Selassie a debutant from Kenya Bedan Karoki watch out for him he's a real talent former world champion Abel Karui coming back into some good form recently winning in Chicago Olympic silver medalist 
and that famous tribute to the tribulations of his people back home in Ethiopia, Fiesa Lelesa, and then this man, Kenani Sabakele, so many gold medals and records on the track, the third fastest marathon runner of all time. How quick can he go today? Chris Thompson, Scott Overall, Tuelde, Johnny Hay there, all men in contention for two British spots for the Great Britain team. Right, a little discussion going on about how we're going to do the start. The Duke and the Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry ready to get us underway. Here we go. The 37th London Marathon gets underway. It could be the greatest ever. Perfect conditions. A sight to behold as ever. The greatest runners from around the world gather in London once more and followed by 40,000 special people, all running for all sorts of causes, but this year, Heads together in particular, very much to the forefront. Let's hope they all have a great day. We look forward to watching them. I know you will at home. Watch them, support them, admire them. Well, Brendan, you've sat here for all 37 years, and this will be the last time you'll be with us. But this must bring back lots of memories, but I suppose every single year as well. You, like me, look forward to what is going to unfold over the next few hours. The London Marathon gets better in three famous hands together, pressing the start button there for a charity which is about to transform the attitudes of Britain towards mental health, which is absolutely marvellous. And we see the streets of London, the beginning of springtime in London, it always seems to me, it's come an awful long way in those 37 years, is now a national institution and Chris Brasher and John Disley, who founded this wonderful event after having try and tried in the New York Marathon just to see if London had the appetite and the attitude and the hospitality towards it. But there they are, London Marathon underway, wonderful, wonderful shots of this magnificent city. And once again, London responds. They're on their way, a record number of starters, which will probably lead to a record number of finishers. There's the red start, where the masses are going through, Greenwich Park in the background, and this is a sight to warm the hearts. The colourfulness is a major change since the grey and navy blue of the early years. Fluorescent yellow stands out there. The numbers, 6,000 in the 1981 London Marathon, 40,000 today. And as they queue up through Greenwich Park, they'll file out slowly, and there, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry. Really fantastic job they've done this year, bringing that mental health together with changing attitudes towards that in Britain. Well, physical health has been changed over the years by the London Marathon, and hopefully this year is the beginning of the mental health change that's going to sweep this nation and the marathon and exercise being part of it. This is absolutely wonderful. Well, of course, many other charities are supported, and Hugh Brasher, who's, of course, taken over, his, his father, Chris, who founded this event back in 1981 with John Disley, no longer with us, the pair of them. But Hugh was saying the other day that over £850 million has been raised so far, and sometime in the next couple of years, it'll be £1 billion for charity, and I don't think even Chris and John Disley could have envisaged that as a... A, almost a byproduct of this great event over the years. Well, we've seen some great races, and I said we're hoping for a couple of great races today. Well, so far, I can tell you that this young lady here, Mary Katani, two-time winner of the London Marathon, has set out, and I'm going to say it's crazy pace. She's got a pacemaker, a training partner there, and they have been going at a pace which will take them not only inside the women's only world record, which Paula has, but also the... <laughs> world record which Paula set in 2003 here and in fact she's running a time or heading at a pace which for me is is just going to result in one thing I know Paula's getting nervous here but I think this is too fast even for Mary Katani 
She's been running under five minute miling, close to five minute miling, hasn't really slowed down yet, but surely she's got to pay for this, Paula. Uh, I keep saying, I, I hope she's going to pay for it. The pace she's run at is phenomenally quick. And to run, uh, what does she run like? Three miles under five minutes, several just around it. She's averaged about 5.04 for the first nine miles. She looks as though she's working hard, but she doesn't look as though she's falling apart yet. Um, and the chase group behind her are also running really, really quickly. That's Vivian Chariot in the yellow socks who tried to close the gap a little bit earlier on and has now decided to drop back. There's Florence Kiplagat just falling off the back of that pack, which isn't surprising because they are still about a minute at 15K inside the pace that I ran when I ran 217.42. Uh, as well so they're all running very very fast so yes some of these will pay for it and there will be a lot of casualties from this pace today but there will be some that are able to maintain it as well this is perhaps the greatest women's field ever and they're running quicker than uh, we've ever seen a group of women running mary katani at the front that was vivian cherry the olympic 5000 meter champion behind her was turnesh de barber three-time olympic champion in her a uh, quest to improve her marathon best cherry in her first ever marathon is going so quick herself but look at the gap they're running incredibly fast but look how far behind they are mary katani out there with her training partner as a pacemaker as she's going through 10 miles and look at the time on the side of your screen there under 51 minutes through 10 miles now that might be her slowest mile parlor i think 514 brendan quick word for you on this how many times have you said to me things are going to change in the last few miles surely that's got to happen today she can't keep this up things are going to change in the later stage of this marathon mary katani we've seen her run very quickly before and at the end of the day it's about the last five or six miles so the question is being asked quite sensibly is she going too fast remember She's run this fast before and faded away. She's a more experienced athlete. I wouldn't be writing her off just yet because I think she is going so quickly, but she looks comfortable. And these are perfect conditions for distance running. And this is the perfect way to do it. Well, she's 10 miles into her 26 mile journey. Many yet to even cross the start line. So let's see what they've got ahead of them. It's a very familiar course for most. It's changed a little bit over the years, but it's always started here in Greenwich. Shooters Hill Road there, you saw Greenwich Park, where we saw the red start, the masses get underway. And they all eventually meet roughly about three miles in. The green and the blue join a little bit earlier than that. And then they run the fast miles and then down towards the Cutty Sark area. And then that's where the big crowds are. We're expecting so much support out on the roads. Great weather today. Through the rather high area, past 10 miles. We've just seen the elite women pass that part. And then they'll be able to see Tower Bridge, the Shard, and uh, know that halfway approaches. And then they head towards Canary Wharf area. And this is the area where there's been a few little changes to the route over the years. A little bit twisty turny. And that's where you can start to feel as you go through 20 miles and then down to the embankment eventually be able to see in the distance Big Ben beckoning them home the last mile then they turn along Birdcage walk around the corner and the last 250 meters or so to the finish line one of the most famous sites in world sport beautiful day perfect running conditions it will take a good few minutes for all 40,000 to cross the start line and of course each of them wearing their own personal transponders which are activated as they cross the start line so of course they all get their individual times and it's probably a good thing that for many of them they get to run a little bit slowly in the first few miles never a bad idea to start slow well, I think David Coleman used to say, the great David Coleman, who's sitting in this seat, used to say, start slow and get slower. And uh, so many people have watched over the years and decided they want to come and take part. And the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry have been really so much involved in this year's event. They've done a fantastic job of encouraging so many people to take part. And Heads Together will benefit hugely. Lots of people wearing that blue 
headband, as you can see, in support of that particular group of charities. That simple thing, though, Steve, that they've been saying, which I thought has been wonderful, is if you've got mental problems, physical activity definitely can help. But also the fact that they've come out and said that discussing your mental problems is something which is of benefit both to you and to the general public, I think has been marvellous. And to actually have the Royals participate as they've done this year with that mission and that message is absolutely incredible. And we know that the physical side is something which is benefits from activity. And now the fact that the mental side has been demonstrated both by doctors and also by, by mental health um, officials is, is absolutely wonderful. And this is a great initiative. Thank goodness for that. And there we are, looking at the back. Look at that guy in the green and white shirt. He's just strolling along there. He's going to get ready. I'll, I'll, I'll come on when I, I come. Hang on. I think the other guy next to him in the dark, uh, he's, he's doing a bit of limbering up and stretching his quads, and uh, he, he's going to be doing that for a little while, <laughs> isn't he? But, but, and there's always somebody who was lying in bed at about 9.15 when the elite women start, went, oh, no, I'm late. And um, we'll just about get there in time to cross the start line a few minutes behind everybody else. But I'll bet, there, I'll bet there'll be somebody late. And I remember several years ago, there was a guy arriving late. And he had a pair of ladders on his back. He had his number and he had his ladders. And I thought, that's fantastic. That's about sums up the London Marathon. But the Royals are giving this fantastic support. Prince Harry almost threatened to run it once next year. But he actually backed off right at the moment. In, the, in that interview, he saw the wisdom. He says, I'm not built for marathon running. But they've encouraged everyone today. The Heads Together charity is a wonderful initiative and to see the young Royals supporting these runners, they'll appreciate it. And I think we're going to see a bit more of them today. I don't think they're just going to do the start. I think they'll do a few other duties, as, as we might call it, during the day, and we're looking forward to seeing that. But London Marathon, an event which in 37 years has become a national institution. And if you think about it, other events that are national sporting institutions have taken hundreds of years to get there. This one, in 37 years, the royal support, the royal patronage, the fist from Prince William, the wave from the Duchess, and a casual little nonchalant well done from Prince Harry. Well done to them, and well done to these runners. Well, as they, the hundreds, the thousands, the masses all get going, uh, it looks as if we have a, a calm and tranquil pack here moving along in the men's wheelchair race, but this has uh, just settled down into this pack again because Marcel Hoog, the favourite, the defending champion, just to the right half of your picture there in this famous silver helmet, he put in a hit over the last kilometre and was actually quite some way clear of the rest. He had uh, David Weir for company, but they had a long gap back to the rest, Tiny Gray Thompson, uh, but they have just been swallowed up by the rest of the pack again. Was he just saying, this is what I've got, just trying something? I think Marcel Hoog wanted to make a serious break because he, he really sort of wound it up to his top speed, had his head down. Dave Weir was sitting right on his back wheel, and then you saw Hoog indicate to Dave Weir to say, come through, and uh, I think Dave Weir declined to come through, that he's making Hoog work for it. But Van Dyke now, um, he's not the strongest sprinter uh, in the world. He needs to get a bit of separation. So Van Dyke is having another little bit of a kick, but, you know, again, this is a, a decent downhill. Uh, you, you can't quite see the top speed they're doing. They're probably about 30, 31 miles an hour at this point. So they're not coasting, they're, they're just trying to uh, maintain the speed. But this is going to be a really interesting sprint finish for this race. Uh, you know, someone's going to have to make a move pretty soon, otherwise they're going to stretch right across the finish line. Yeah, it's just about 10 minutes or so from the finish. They were on a course record pace of 127 or so early on, but the second half of the race, in particular for wheelchair racers, is a bit slower. Um, so the pace has dropped down to about an hour and a half pace as they head back towards uh, Tower Bridge here. Then they'll go along the embankment, and then, as uh, Steve was explaining on the course map a wee while ago, round and into the mile. So they're not too far away. And uh, Fry, the Heinz Fry, the 59-year-old from Switzerland, who has been around for so, so long now, and is such an inspiration to many within wheelchair racing, just hits the front. But there are so many within this pack who can win, but only a few of them who can do it with the, the serious sprint finish that I think it's going to take Tani in the final 200 metres or so. 
I think there's going to be a lot of people looking over their shoulders now and deciding to make a break. So this looks like a, a fairly serious break for Fry because he's a high paraplegic. He won't have the sprint finish that the others do, but he will have a, a really good top speed and he's going to really want to make people work to pull people out and, and start dropping off some of those who could get in the way for the sprint finish. Meanwhile, in the women's race, a little bit further uh, back down the course, uh, there is a, a minute lead from Manuela Schaar, the, uh, the Swiss athlete, the strong favourite. Might be a Swiss double with Manuela Schaar in the women's and uh, Marcel Hook still looking strong in the men's, but it's going to be a sprint finish in the men's race in uh, just about 10 minutes or so. Well, the big story unfolding in the elite women's race is that Mary Catani is running quicker in a marathon than anyone, including Paula, has ever done. Uh, whether she's going to be able to maintain this is, well, I think is a huge question mark. And she's just run another 5.06 mile for the 11th mile. She's going to reach halfway in a crazily fast time, which is certainly heading her for way inside. I mean, she is the second fastest woman ever behind Paula, 218.37. She's heading for something, you know, minutes inside of that. She's 35. She's never run this quick, ever. And I, I'm just not sure what's going on here because Mary's an experienced runner. She is in good shape. We know that runner personal best for half marathon earlier in the year. But surely she must be, she must have thought to herself, yeah, okay, I want to, I feel good today. I might go through in 68 and a half or something like that. But this I, I keep looking at you, you two sitting next to me, Paul and Brendan, but because, you know, it, to see an experienced runner going this fast, it just seems odd. Well, she is very experienced, though, and she, she knows she's in shape. And one thing that Mary is as well, she's very, very confident and competitive. And she came here, obviously, within her mind that she wanted to go out there and make a mark, set a fast time and beat that record today. And she's gone out after it. She is getting some good pacing from, from the pacemaker in front of her, who is looking over her shoulder, that's a 5.16, so she slowed down a little bit for that mile, but that has to be expected at some point here. She has to start easing back uh, in order to be able to, to come to the finish and to maintain this pace. And she has to be aware of the fact that she has this group chasing behind her too. And we can see that Vivian Chariot in the bright yellow socks was a little bit ahead of this group. So either Vir Vivian has backed off a little and still running very, very well, or this chasing group is making up ground on Mary Katani ahead. And Tiranesh Dibaba, again, not so experienced at the marathon, but very experienced as an athlete, will not like the fact that Mary Katani is so far up the road ahead of her. She also doesn't like the fact that the rest of the athletes are getting on her shoulder. She's been weaving from side to side because they were tracking in behind her, but she was trying to get rid of that leading pace. She hasn't got a pacemaker. She's actually setting the pace for the second group. But this race certainly isn't over. Whatever happens today, the second half of this women's marathon is going to be dramatic. We're looking at two Olympic champions in the chasing group. The reigning 5,000-meter champion, number 130, that's Vivian Chariot. And then the leader of that group is the great Tiranesh de Barba, three times Olympic champion, the most successful female distance runner in the history of the Olympic Games. And there she is, looking around, offering her drinks, leading the pace. And as we look at the yellow socks, there's Vivian Chariot, who won that marvelous 5,000 meters in the Olympic Games recently in Rio and then decided it's time for me to run on the roads. So we're looking at athletic royalty here chasing down Mary Katani, who has set an awesome pace. She's going to be through the halfway in the fastest ever as they approach Tower Bridge. The crowds are gathering. The atmosphere is rising. And there's Mary Katani being cheered. She's got a pacemaker for company. She's running faster than anyone's run before. And whilst we look at the statistics, it looks a bit bold and a bit brave and a bit too aggressive. But seriously, when Paula was doing this, we were asking the same sort of questions. Paula was being brave and pushing out into a new world. Well, this lady is pushing even more so. And at the end of the day, if you're the second fastest marathon runner of all time, the only way you're possibly going to become the fastest marathon runner of all time is by attacking it. But maybe this is a little bit too much of a bold, aggressive move. And as we look down on the other side of Tower Bridge, we'll see the approaching number two, the Olympic champion, Tiranish de Barber. Well, I think she's already starting to pay for this. She just ran her slowest mile in the previous mile. I think she's slowing down already. This is a crazy fast pace, 63.25 for 20K. 
But if you think that her first 10K was 31.17, her second 10K was 32.08. So she's already slowed a minute for that second 10 kilometer. Even though she's very fast, she's going to go through in well under 68 minutes at the halfway point, and, uh, which is very quick, obviously. But this is the interesting bit. The pacemaker, which is a training partner, is not waiting for her anymore, which is a bit silly because the pacemaker has gone quicker than she was meant to. At this point, if anything, she should be helping Katani, but I think Katani's already suffering. I agree with Bren as well. I think even the ones behind might suffer a little bit, which there may even be one or two who are further back than that who still managed to come through. I think there's lots of changes going to happen here as they approach halfway. They've just crossed over, and the elite men a long way back, just through between three and four miles. Here they are, and a pretty quick start for them. In fact, they've just gone through four miles. They've started very quick as well. And uh, if we can tell you that... Uh, we're going to talk about records a lot today, obviously, but this is a bit more sensible from the men. They are on world record pace, but they're kind of doing it right. They've gone 436, 435, 430, which is that quick third mile that Paula talked about, 440, 1821. So it's about t uh, 15 seconds up on what Kipchoge did last year. Kipchoge didn't start that quick, sort of speeded up towards the end. So I think good pacing, good to see Bikili looking comfortable. Very early stages, though. And you can tell which head he's got on today. Kenanisa Bikili, the Olympic champion, world record holder for five and 10,000 meters. He's He's in amongst the pacemakers. You can tell he's encouraging them to go fast. And still, as we wait, Greenwich Park, they're limbering up at the back. They're walking slowly to go through the gates. But the good news is when they get through the gates, their own chip timing will start. So they're not losing anything. They're just gradually pouring onto the course. The organization of this London Marathon has got better and better over the years. And the wonderful start area at Greenwich Park, it lends itself to an event like this. Well, there is only one event like this. This is the best marathon in the world. That is one of the best sights in the world of sport, in my view. It's been a pleasure being here doing it. They're dancing on the start line. They're raising money for the NSPCC and for the Leonard Cheshire charity as they as they move on through taking pictures of the royals and they're being very welcome with that great picture now get them to do a selfie with you that's the next thing and i bet that happens during the course of the day and as they get on the start line she's got her collector's item whiz kids another great charity the london disability charity in there they're all queuing up they're all getting ready they're all in good spirits and the joyous occasion the, this, this London Marathon, the Royal Institute for the Blind, Heart, the British Heart Foundation, Children for Cancer. It is wonderful to see. Now they're moving closer, they're getting attracted to the... They're going to get in amongst it soon, you can sense. They're going to be talking on the way back, I bet you they're saying to each other, do you think we should run it next time? Do you think one of us should... Who, which one of us is going to run it? Well, they keep pushing Harry forward, but uh, all three of them would be contenders. They're all athletic young people and this is a great sight the slow procession through the gates of greenwich park ready to start the journey which will eventually bring them where we are in the mall in front of buckingham palace yeah so many great stories uh, which uh, we you know, we try and reflect as many as we possibly can and uh, we'll all mention a few during the course of the afternoon just want to give a mention to uh, Laura Hodgkins, who's running for Walking with the Wounded and uh, running for a mum, Sue. Who suffered a brain hemorrhage in February, and uh, we all pass on our best wishes to Sue, battling her way back, hopefully, to full health. So many uh, mentions that uh, we'll be trying to give, and uh, I know that uh, you'll be hoping to spot your loved ones out there as well. We'll do our best. Well, they're just about all the way through, but we're going to keep you uh, up to date with what's happening in the wheelchair next. And a very strong Japanese threat to those favourites. We talked about of Marcel Hoog and David Weir, who are in second and third, and Fernley behind and fourth, the Australian. But it's uh, Nishida out in front at the moment. Hiroki Nishida finished fifth 
in Boston, was sixth in uh, last year's London Marathon as well, but it is Tani Gray Thompson certainly going to come down to that sprint finish in the mile. This is the biggest uh, pack we've ever had for the men's wheelchair race, and even coming past Westminster, there's still a few more turns to come, uh, and, you know, everyone's getting a little bit nervous now. As they come from around the final bend into the finish, we have actually got combs on the road and there's some boarding. They're going to be spread right across the road. And I'm sure by now Marcel's going to be wanting to make sure, and we're going to be wanting to make sure they're right at the front of the pack, that they're not going to get caught up in the final turn. You see Nishida wanting to get the bike out of the way as well there, which it does, and Nishida now has clear road in front of him, but everyone just sitting and just behind him there, Marcel Hook, the favourite, the defending champion, has a wonderful sprint finish. So too David Weir, he wears these soft gloves, as Tani was saying, others wear these hard gloves. You can't hear him tapping on the drive rim, you can't hear him coming, but it's Nishida out in front, then Hook, then David Weir, is it to be a seventh London Marathon victory for him? Kurt Fernley as well, the Australian just behind him. This is shaping up to be a great finish. I'm actually feeling slightly nervous because of the, the number of guys that are in this pack. They're all watching. You've got Ernst van Dijk on the right-hand side. Um, he has crashed in the finish line before now because he sprints with his head down. So you've not only got to be aware of who's on your left and right, you've also got to be aware of exactly what's in front of you on the road. And as you said about Dave Weir, because he wears the soft gloves, you can't hear him kicking. He's, he's kind of quite devastating when he decides to go. And, you know, they're all looking over each other's shoulders. Marcel is looking right. He just wants to hold that wheel. He wants to be in the front, but they also want to try and get a little bit of protection. And, and here where the road narrows down, you know, it, it makes it really hard on the guys because you're having to turn and, and try and keep up the momentum of pushing. We're, uh, we're two turns away from the final sprint finish. So there we are, 385 yards beyond the 26 miles to go. And out in front, that is Marcel Hook, David Weir sitting on his shoulder firmly as they are the big three as they come around this final bend. So Hook is Weir right in his shadow, right in his slipstream. Is he judging this well? The final bend and the finish line waits. Six victories in the London Marathon for David Weir, the defending champion, though Marcel Hook has it at the moment. Weir drives, gets those arms pumping. He's alongside and he's passing. And Hook, does he have a response? Weir dips his head and drives on. And a seventh London Marathon victory is going to come for David Weir. And the Weirwolf roars again. 1 hour 31. Weir has victory number seven. Beats the defending champion, Marcel Hook. What a win for David Weir. I'm not sure he is going to retire, but if he is, what a way to go out. I think he'll be back for more, but what a victory. Victory number seven in London. That, I think, is David Weir's best marathon I've ever seen him race. Absolutely incredible. I really hope this is not it for him. He's got so much more to give. And to, to absolutely come past Marcel in that final sprint finish is amazing. He might even give us a smile. I hope he does. No, that's too much to ask. There we are. Spent after the effort of winning a seventh London Marathon in his 18th. And he is alongside Marcel Hoog, who has had the better of him in recent seasons, in recent years. But it is Weir winning again here on the mile. And uh, Hoog, well, again, the tactics of it, it's when you take out that sprint as well. And Weir was just able to sit, sit behind Marcel Hoog and use him and then come past with that, that famous sprint finish that we, we used to see in years gone by, perhaps we just haven't seen in the last couple of seasons so much. It's, it's not been there in the last two or three years, and this is where everyone starts rushing to him because, you know, everyone in, in the UK wanted Dave to, to have a good race today. You know, for him as much as anything else, but that's a devastating sprint finish for Dave Weir. The, the top speed between him and Hook are similar, but, but in that situation, coming around the final bend, I thought it was Hook's, but absolutely not. Well done, Dave. We're really proud of you. Well, we might not see him on the track. He may still race in the Commonwealth Games. He has his, uh, his problems with the GB squad, of course. I don't think we're going to see him on the track, but uh, I, he still loves racing. He loves racing. He loves road racing. And here on uh, some of the most famous roads in, in racing, he's done it again. And uh, on the mile, he wins his seventh London Marathon title. Well done, David Weir.
Manuela Schaar in the women's uh, race has a big, big lead. It's not going to be a Swiss double because a Marcel Hoog was seen off by David Weir, but Manuela Schaar is surely going to win the, the women's event. And again, in the absence of uh, Tatiana McFadden, the American who's won this for the last four years, and when Schaar has been second for the last three, well, it was clear who was going to step up with uh, McFadden being uh, indisposed. So Schaar is going to take quite a comfortable victory. A very different race in this one uh, in Tani. Well, I was talking with uh, Heinz Frey, who's uh, Manuela's training partner, and he was saying she never had the confidence to go it alone, but actually winning Boston last week has suddenly given her uh, a new feeling, and, and she realised she has got that talent. She's been around a long time and has always been there or thereabouts, has never performed at Paralympics the way we might have expected, but, you know, uh, I think we're going to see great things from her to come. Yeah, coming through 35k, so 7k from uh, the finish. Uh, Shah had a lead of over two minutes from Amanda McCrory, the American. Then uh, Susanna Scaroni, another American, with uh, the Dutch athlete Marguerite van den Broek in fourth. And Jade Jones in, in fifth place. But Manuela Shah is a long, long way clear and heading for victory in the London Marathon. Well, this is the... Elite men at Cutty Sark, good pace being set by them over the first five miles. Kenisa Bekele, Germe Gebrselassie, the young world champion there, still yet to do, to do a really fast marathon, although he's obviously shown that he's capable of that. Bekele with his phalanx of pacemakers. The rules say you're only allowed three. You'll probably spot a fourth black and white vest towards the back there. I, I think, think he's on the wrong pace, isn't he? Isn't yeah, he supposed to be back not, with the Yeah, exactly. They all get group. mixed up. There are different paces for different groups. And um, the British men have, caught, have asked for, there's, I think, even two groups, 2.11 and 2.14. Qualifying time for the British men is 2.16. We're watching, or we will be following the progress of uh, Tuelde, Scott Overall, Chris Thompson, uh, Levincello, one or two others in there, we'll be hoping they can have a big day today. But at the front of the men, at pace, it, it's certainly giving them a chance of uh, being close to world record pace. Really what they're after, what Kenanisa wants is to get to 30k at a good pace, and that if he's feeling good, he'll want less people around him, there's not that many, and I don't think the quality in the men's race is quite as high as it is in the women's race. Uh, and then we'll see really what Kenanisa wants to do. Those last 15k, last 10k is where the records are won and lost. If you if you pace it right, I'm going to say right now that I think Mary Katani um, has gone too quick, but we'll uh, catch up with her in a second. Just to show you where they are, as I said, we've just seen the men go, the lead men go through Cutty Sark. And the elite women, while well, Mary Katani is slowing down. And she's slowing down quickly, if you know what I mean. And uh, it'd be interesting to see whether the others who are also slowing down behind, uh, Chariot and Debarba, as we uh, just lose uh, the signal with Mary Katani there. But what I can tell you is she went through the half marathon quicker than any woman, including herself, has ever gone through the half marathon point. And talking about going quick, Ali Dixon is leading the British contingent by about 30 seconds. She's ahead of Charlotte Perdue. She went through the half quicker than she was planning to, and she's heading for a sub-228 clocking, which would be a big personal best for Ali Dixon. So everybody in Sunderland will be cheering her. I've got something to cheer in Sunderland, Brendan, anyway. You keep mentioning Sunderland. You keep mentioning the black and white stripes. I'm ignoring it neatly because of uh, contrasting fortunes, but Ali Dixon is running strongly. And now she's in a position, she could run a personal best from here. And there's a head down of Mary Katani. Well, we've seen this great athlete, the second fastest female athlete of all time. She's clearly set off to try and become the fastest female athlete of all time. The fastest sitting just a few along from me here. But Mary Katani has demonstrated in the past that she's not a great face judgment person. She ran the New York Marathon a few years ago. She went through just a minute slower than she's gone through today. And, and she slowed drastically that day. Well, she may not slow as drastically, but she's beginning to show signs that she is slowing a little. A long, solitary pursuit for Mary Katani, as it has been in the women's wheelchair race for uh, Manuela Shara. I say solitary, she has had some company because this, these are a couple of the, the men lower down the field in the uh, men's wheelchair and behind her and uh, them in the distance you can see Manuela Shah 
who is coming towards the finish. And there she is, second in 2014, in 2015, and in 2016, behind Tatiana McFadden. McFadden, the American, who's won the last four years, has been suffering from blood clots, had surgery recently after trying to compete in Boston and couldn't make the trip to compete here. But Shah has been a, a class apart. She won Boston by a huge margin, five minutes or so. And uh, she's coming round to win here as well. Very, very different race to the men's race, which came down to that furious and fast sprint finish. But uh, this has been a demonstration of uh, Shah's strength. Well, it's been a superbly timed race for Shah. I mean, Amanda McGrory, you know, the, the top five women who are going to finish today are all some of the best in the world. And Shah's um, kilometre times have been really evenly paced. So, she, you know, she knows that she's got that ability. Um, it's going to be outside to sort of a personal best, but actually for her, the win is really important in terms of getting that confidence to go into the rest of the marathon major racing season. And personal bests are very, very different in wheelchair marathons because of the different courses. Everyone goes very, very quick. Uh, well, can go very, very quick in Boston, which has an overall drop of about 140 metres. But 200 metres remain now for Manuela Shah, and the course record of one hour 41 minutes here in London, which is held by Tatiana McFadden. And just looking for the time of Manuela Shah because it's been her against the clock for much of this race. But Shah is going to take her first victory in the London Marathon, second for the last three years. But here she will take victory in just a shade under one hour 40, well, just over it there. But that is a course record and a victory in the London Marathon, a first victory in this event for Manuela Shah. Well, finally, everybody across the start line, the perhaps one or two latecomers, well, that's it, everybody, just about everybody across the start line, just the last few setting off on their way. We'll give you, a, hopefully, when, as soon as we get it, how many actually cross the start line, because once everyone's over, they will very quickly be able to tell us how many have started. It could well be a record, set a record last year of just over 39,000 people started out. In fact, most of them finished, over 39,000 finished. There was only a couple of hundred didn't make it. And I think that's one of the great things these days. The dropout rate on the day is very, very low. The fact, like, 99% of people who start will finish. And there's the last couple of... They're walking down the road. I wonder if they're going to intent on walking all the way around. And there, he's, she's just arrived. Is she looking at a map? Uh, she's got, I think she's got one well, or two she can follow. Yeah, which and, been... and, the, and the, of course, the great thing, I think that's a guide uh, there. The people wear names on their shirts. Uh, they say where they, who are, what they're running for, walking for, so people around the route can give them a bit of a cheer and support and shout. Much further ahead, this is around the Canary Wharf area. Uh, we'll just check in with the men first. Well, the men are running sub 2-2 pace through the first 10K, 28.51 through 10 kilometers. So, real intent here, big group. Again, you know, Ken Anissa Bikili has some legitimate right to go at that sort of pace. Most of the others don't. So, you know, if you... if <laughs> I always find this funny because you know, if you, even with these top guys here, you know, Karoki running his first ever marathon, you wouldn't say, I'll tell you what to do, mate, for the first 10K, like, run it two, three minutes inside the world record pace, and let's see how that goes. I mean, that wouldn't be your plan, would it? <laughs> that's, that's correct analysis, Steve. You can't possibly come just from training to step into a marathon and run at world record pace. But I'm looking at Kenanisa Bikili. You know, if you look at these other athletes, he's two minutes f slower than his personal best for 10K, so he should be comfortable here. But when I've watched Kenanisa over the years, we've seen some fantastic races from Kenanisa. We've seen the occasional average race. His, his marathon that he ran last year in London, when he wasn't 100% fit, the, the body language of Kenanisa Bikili was to sit at the back of the group. Today, you can see a Kenanisa Bikili who's trying to encourage the pacemakers to go even faster because he knows that coming up soon, the Olympic champion, Elliot Kipchoge, is going to attempt to run the first two-hour marathon. And before that fast time comes, Kenanisa's got this idea that he'd like to become the first man to simultaneously hold the world records for five, for ten, and for the marathon. Now, can he do that? Could he do it today? He's got some good company, he's got some good competition, 
He's having good support. He's having good support from the from the pacemakers. He's fitter now than he's been for a marathon, except in Berlin when he ran the second fastest marathon of all time. Now, we've seen Mary Katani trying to become this from the second to the fastest. There she is. We're now looking at Kenanisa trying to become the fastest, but Kenanisa Bakili is doing it more conservatively. Mary Katani has done it extremely aggressively. Now, has she got the strength, the willpower, and the determination to hang on? Yeah, Paula, she's... Uh, I know you, you keep looking at the times, and I keep saying the same thing, that uh, you know, she's either... Uh, she's still on 2.13 or sub-2.14 pace, but starting to slow now. With each mile, I think those early fast, fast miles are beginning to take their toll. And I don't know what you think, but uh, this is going to be a slog for the last few miles for Mary Katani. Oh, it's, it's definitely going to be a, a race of attrition from her now to, to keep her body going. The easier way to run a marathon is definitely to run negative splits, so to run faster in the second half of the marathon. She's, well, that's pretty much impossible, the pace that she went through in the first half. It's not possible for her to close faster. What she needs to try and do is hold it together, and she is doing that. I mean, she is slowing down. She slowed down, what, to 2.14.30 pace, so she's still running very, very fast. She still has a lead of about one minute and six on the chasing group behind her, who are also running very, very fast. So there are going to be some people pay a lot of price for the early pace, and there are still going to be some people way further down, the likes of Mara de Barba, Tigis Tufa, who might move through Kibeda as well, moving through the field. Yeah, just on those times that were put up, obviously included your times here and Mary Katani's times here. So you're the, just to reiterate the point, all of those brilliant times, the fastest we've ever seen in the world, ever run in the marathon distance, and she set off through the first half over a minute quicker for the first half than Paula went through in 68.02 when she ran 2.15.25. And Mary Katani today went through in under 67 minutes, 66.53. She's slowing down. I guess the only question is, A, will she make it to the finish? And I know that you say that, you say the elite runners, surely, of course they will. But even they suffer if they get it horribly wrong. She may well have got it horribly wrong. If she hasn't, she's going to be hanging on and hanging on for a time here today. But if anybody's got the right to try and shatter that world record, it's the second fastest marathon runner of all time. She's not doing it in the conventional, mathematical and studious way of running steady pace. She's gone very quickly. She may have gone too quickly, but it's very much up to her, as we see Ali Dixon, the leading British athlete. But we're looking at a fantastic performance from Ali Dixon. Really, really good performance. But we're looking at somebody who's trying to change the world at the front, and that's Mary Katani. Yeah, Ali's having a great race at the moment. Let's hope she's judged it well, because she's opening up a big lead on the next British athlete, Charlotte Clergy, who's about 45 seconds behind Ali Dixon. Ali's heading at this point for 2.27, around about that. That's a couple of minutes quicker than she's ever run before. Ali does like to get out hard and try and you know, work those last few miles but uh, this is quicker than she's sort of gone before. Looks good at the moment. She does, and, and she is in better shape. I mean, help out Ali a little bit with her training. She's in better shape than she's ever been coming into a marathon. She knows that. She's confident. She knows that conditions are perfect out there today, and she wanted to go out there and give it her best shot. She doesn't look as though she's, she's gone too fast to me. She looks as though she's in control, and, and she's taking a little bit of energy on board there and pacing her effort well. Yeah, you can see there the leading times through 25k. The British women, it, uh, it's Ali out there in front. Then don't forget there are three places available. Charlotte Perdue, Tracy Barlow going really well. Joe Pavey's a little bit behind. I know a lot of people will be watching, waiting to see whether Joe can make the World Championship team. But at the moment, she's out of the positions that would qualify her, or you would think, to be selected. That selection will happen in the next couple of days. So, back at the front. 9.4 miles to go, that point four. Mary Katani all on her own now, all on her own in, not only out there on the roads, but in terms of what she's trying to do here, has gone quicker than even she has done, even quicker than Paula Radcliffe has done through those first 14, 15 miles. And now it's going to be a long, hard slog. She'll be trying to concentrate as much as she can, but... I mean, you guys have run marathons, I've run a couple. Many people who've done know that it's those last three, four, five miles where it, you can really fall apart. So let's wait and see what happens there. And the men, well, so far so good for them. 
good pace, very fast pace, really fast pace. We get used to seeing this a little bit more with the men. We've had some races that I remember three or four years ago, this big group went through really quick, didn't they? And around the hotel during the week, uh, there's been a lot of talk about can Ken Anissa break the world record? Does he want to? Brent's talked about the shape he's in and uh, about whether there was enough competition for him here. And I think, and that's a bit of a moot point because sometimes you don't want competition. You want, it's, a, it's a high risk strategy to go for records, to go for a high pace. But he's already looking as though he's wanting to force this on here. He's ahead of the pacemakers, looking for his drink, gets a clear look at the drinks table. Really important that they get their own personalized drinks. And then he just settles back in again. And that's why he went to the front, he knew the drink station was coming up. He's been working hard at getting this right because this is an important part of the race, the, high, the rehydration. And in the past, Kennedy has not paid too much attention to this. But now, as he's committed to running fast marathons, he takes the drink on board. His teammate, Lilesa, the Olympic silver medalist, just behind him, joined him at the feed station there. And Kennedy taking it gently, sipping the drink that's been formulated for him. And Kennedy Bakili, when you look at his attitude on the track, you see this kind of running. Now we're watching him on the roads running with aggression in the marathon, running alongside and amongst the pacemakers. This is one of, the, in my view, one of the two greatest distance runners of all time. I think Mo Farah has got an equal claim to Ken Anissa. Ken has done more world records, but Mo's won more Olympic titles. But Ken Anissa wants to do something that no one's ever done before. He wants to hold the world record for the 5,000, the 10,000 and the marathon. And he's had some difficult times, he's had some tough times. Even this year, he went to Dubai, he fell over in the start of that race and was injured and couldn't run, couldn't finish the race. But he's back here now, he's ready to run quick. He does want to run quick. And you know, when he smells in the later stages that he's in contention for that fastest time, we're looking at an athlete who's got an engine like no other. Some of the physiologists have told me that this is his physiology as such, that he has got the greatest capacity for endurance running that they've ever seen. There he is now, in amongst the pacemakers, his teammate Lilesa, the Olympic silver medalist, and the two of them are just pulling clear, but Ken Anissa is showing intent. He's had a few niggles, he's had a few problems. He was ill three weeks ago, but his manager, who's done a great job with Ken Anissa over the years, Jos Hermans was telling me yesterday, he goes from nervous to being less nervous, but he says, when you leave it, when you leave it to Ken Anissa, his attitude to racing is better than anyone else's. So there he is in third place in the white vest behind the three black and white shirts of Shaftesbury Harriers. Well, they're going very quick indeed. World record pace, inside world record pace in the men's race, inside world record pace in the women's race. Meanwhile, back at Cuddy Sark, some of these are quick runners, these folks going through, uh, approaching 10K for them. And uh, going pretty well indeed. The race started, of course, about 45 minutes ago, just over 45 minutes. Any of you do your 10Ks, uh, you know they're going pretty well. Just one or two people for uh, to give a shout out to. Met a couple yesterday running. Uh, Alicia White and Amy Savage. Alicia running for Sparks Children, Amy running for Children with Cancer. And, uh, I think they were heading for around the four hour mark, or hoping for the four hour mark. And Cuddy Sark looks beautiful, doesn't it? The, uh, refurbished, if that's the right words. It's uh, always been a great landmark of the London Marathon. For many years, we couldn't see it, could we, while we're, they were undergoing all of this work, but looks resplendent in the, I was going to say morning sunshine. It's kind of hiding behind the clouds occasionally, but it's a beautiful morning in London. Great day for marathon running. The temperature expected to get up to about 15 degrees, so not too bad. Maybe a little warm for some of the later finishes, but pretty perfect conditions for trying to chase fast times and still chasing one Mary Katani she's tired she's slowing but isn't slowing too much at this point the last mile there she's just gone through another one in 4 5 14 she's still heading for inside 215 and don't forget that record of Paula's back in 2003 215 25 so she's got a, a, a minute or so in in hand if you like on that but this is the lonely bit that i mean your dad was right at one point that uh, there are parts of the course out here paula which uh, get a little bit lonely but i mean they they she's got a watch on there i mean surely she knows uh, what she's got to do from this point in or is it or is it just concentrating on almost step by step now 
It's absolutely just concentrating on it. I mean, I don't think she's really looked at her watch the whole way. She doesn't actually need to because she's got the splits on the car in front of her. She's got the splits on every mile marker as she goes through them and the 5K markers. But it's not the way she runs either. She runs according to feel, which is really the way that you have to race a marathon anyway. You have to gauge your effort against the distance to get the most out of yourself over that. And we'll see that in the men's race as well. Although they have half an eye on the splits, I just think if you start aiming too much to hit certain split times you get too much in your head and you need to just run according to the sensations you've had in training and where you've worked to there to, to know your body and to know where you can push to and where is that line that you can almost ride along and that's exactly what she's doing now she's pushed as hard as she can and she's trying to hold it at that point to be able to get to the finish with nothing left and she's won five of her ten marathons she's run quickly second fastest female distance runner of all time in the marathon she's running strongly at points here but occasionally you sense when you see there's a little bit of an incline you sense she's working extremely hard but she is she wasn't able to run in the olympic games she ran london last year and fell and so that was a bad occasion but she came back won the new york marathon so she loves the big marathon she runs new york and she won new york three times she won london twice and apart from those, she's lost the others, and she didn't. There's the chasing group, and it looks like it looks like Tiranish de Barber, the Olympic, and Kiprop from Kenya. But there's Tiranish de Barber, the three times Olympic champion, working hard at this point in second place. The traditional form with the style we see her, the caliber of this athlete, second to none in the world of distance running, three times Olympic champion numerous times world champion but Tiranish de Barba now without a pacemaker as she's been for most of the way but running strongly and running well and who knows what's going to happen in front are we looking at the potential winner of this London marathon or are we looking at Tiranish coming to be in second place well she's definitely looking strong Tiranish there and she's made up a five six second gap on Kiprop who does look very tired and she is going to fade back down the field uh, without a doubt and there will be others who will get her in their sights and work on her and that's what's going to happen in both of these races I think today with the pace that they've set out at there will inevitably be some people who will just come back down the road that's what we're seeing further back although that was a look over a shoulder from Tiranesh de Barber there just to see who else is going with her and moving through here but, but, but you know when you watch Tiranesh you know how great she's a runner but the one thing she's terrible at Paula is turning over turning around trying to see what she nearly fell over a couple of times doing that she's hopeless at that yeah and there's a few streets that you I mean uh, one or two of us can have a little jog in recent days some more than others but um, there's a street round this out uh, uh, actually they've already come down it I think narrow road and the, the speed bumps and what I mean by that is just uh, just little things on the road and if you don't watch what you're doing you're, it's very easy to trip up if you're not careful because um, it happened to me <laughs> <laughs> as you go slower Steve the, the exactly. speed bumps become the a hills. problem no the hills actually the hills Right, Mary Katani, what is she heading for here? Through 18 miles, very, very fast. Has just gone through 30K and the time is slipping. And I can say there's the predicted time, if I went back to halfway or before halfway, it was 2.13, then it was just outside 2.14, then it was high 2.14s. And for the first time, her predicted time has now slipped to 15.08, would still be a world record, but I don't think she's going to do that. The uh, record I said 215.25. Katani now for me needs to start. Well, she, she'll just be concentrating, but if Tiranesh de Barba keeps running strongly, just needs to keep running strongly, there she is. Then or she's about a minute behind, just less than a minute behind. We'll see when we get the 30k split uh, when she goes through the 30k point, but she might have a chance here. She just may have a chance. There she is, chasing. And when she starts to be able to see Katani at some point, it may be a little while yet, but that will also help her confidence. Well, I've just had a note from Mark Butler, our statistician, who's just told me that Mary Katani has just broken the world record at 30K. And the world record, she's beaten by two minutes at 30K. So she's got world records here at 30K, as we watch Tiranus de Barba stop and pick up a drink. 
she's not very good at that either apart from turning around she's not very good at, she's a great runner but the in between bits she needs to work on a little bit harder but we're looking at an athlete who is en route broken the world record by two minutes which is staggering yeah but all i'm gonna say is 31 17 for the first 10k 32 08 for the second 10k 32 40 for the third 10k what's she going to do in the fourth 10k i suggest it'll be well outside 33 minutes it's still quick running though 33 minutes for 10k is still I'm just very very quick running down. so she is slowing but she's not she's not falling apart she's maintained she's looking back over her shoulder she's not going to see anybody for a long way down the road because the other group have not yet gone through the 30k marker and that's well over two minutes so that gap is growing and growing she, i don't think she's in any danger of being caught unless she actually stops and walks and i can't see her from this point fading that much i watched her in new york when she went out far too fast and i think she learned a lesson from that and she had to learn a lesson you had to learn that she'd gone out too quickly there certainly in new york with the respect that you need to give the second half of the course and the hills in new york but this second half is in my opinion quicker than the first half in the london marathon and she is holding it together she's not showing the signs of distress that she showed when she ran that quick through the first half in new york but you know she is the second fastest she wants to become the fastest you can't blame her for going out aggressively she may have gone out too aggressively she may pay the price for that but listen she is an athlete who is allowed to run like this because she is the second fastest of all time 78 seconds her lead over Tiranesh de Barber at 30 kilometers so even Tiranesh de Barber would have been inside the old world record as well Tiranesh de Barber with 137 23 was inside the old world record for that distance there she is to me she's looking well she should stop looking behind that's not where anything's happening it's can she keep solid keep going strong her cadence looks better to me than mary katani's she's always been a great runner don't know why she's looking to watch there's a big thing on the watch it just says you're going very fast so tiranesh de Barba heading for a massive personal best for her certainly at the moment mary katani if she sees the absolute world record slipping away the women's only one certainly still within sight for her of 217 42 but she still needs to get her head down and keep working hard it's going to be tough for her as she enters her last what seven or eight miles the men though are heading towards tower bridge and it's as you were kananisa bekele still tucking in behind the pacemakers Germe gabri selassie the diminutive figure in the white also abel kirui see on the left there the former world champion gabri selassie is the current world champion lilessa the olympic silver medalist in the group there and uh, one or two others uh, men um managers to the other ethiopian i'm just looking to see if uh, there he is karoki i was just seeing if he was in the group right in the middle the debutant from kenya also there's uh, ragasa so plenty for Kananisa Bikili to think about, but I would say, as far as he's concerned, so far, so good. So far, so good from the great Kananisa Bikili. Well, I'll tell you what, some of these athletes are going to pay for it in the second part of the race. They've gone too quickly. You can't run this fast unless you're a great one, and he is a great one, Kananisa. He knows what he's doing. He is the second fastest marathon runner of all time. He wants to become the fastest. He wants to do it today. If he can't do it today, he'll probably try later in the year to do it again. But Kenanisa, when he's running well, there is no better sight than distance running. Olympic champion, world record holder, the best cross-country runner the world's ever seen. He's won it all. Can he win this one? He hasn't won this one. Well, we've seen some sights over the years in London, and this is one which was added a few years ago, the Shard. And it gives a, a real focal point for those on the south side as they head towards Tower Bridge, because you can't see Tower Bridge until you actually turn the corner, and then suddenly you're upon it, whereas the Shard you can see from a long way away. This is about one of the worst hills on the course. It doesn't look like it on there, but actually Tower Bridge is quite a little bit of a rise uh, at 12 miles and they will be experiencing that little rise but also the big crowds that then start to gather it's a favorite spot for spectating because you get the chance to see your favorites as they enter tower bridge coming through 12 miles and then coming back in the other direction so the uh, they 
are being cheered by these crowds and Kenanisa Bekele there settling in. They've slowed down a little bit, Paula, but still on very good pace. Yeah, and you talk about the rise as they come over Tower Bridge, and that is almost totally negated by the support and the noise that you experience as you come over it and a little bit of a drop off it. So it's a pretty fast mile as you drop over it, you pass halfway and in your mind as well, that's a significant marker to pass halfway in the marathon feeling good. That's when the real racing is, is going to start coming through and they are racing already at this point and they're moving very, very fast. But I think this race is just hotting up and this is one of those occasions when sometimes you get a lot of good guys racing together and the pace is actually slow because everybody's watching each other. But here, they're feeding off each other and I think this is going to continue to wind and wind. Although it is starting to spread out a little bit, there are some gaps within there opening up and the guy that's making me laugh is the fourth pacemaker who's really, really working as hard as he can to hang on the back of that pack instead of dropping back to help the group behind. Well, they are through 20K, the Tower of London, one of the great sights of this most famous of routes. So once they are beyond Tower Bridge, they pass the halfway point, head out towards Canary Wharf. And uh, again, pretty good crowds these days through this area. And uh, 20 miles is where the race often begins, doesn't it, for the elites. So come back onto the embankment, past Tower, sorry, past Tower Bridge onto the embankment. And then those last two or three miles, where it can all go right and it can all go horribly wrong as well. And into the finish in the mile. Well, not too far away now, Mary Katani, but that stride length looks pretty short now for me. And uh, she's hurting, but she's still running incredibly fast. Her overall time, even if she's slowed in the last two, three miles and maybe will continue to slow, at some point, that will be replaced by, hey, hang on, I'm still going well here, I'm still in this, I'm still up for a personal best. Uh, one of the fastest times ever. That's certainly in store for her, as long as she can hold it together over these last few miles. I wonder if she's getting enough information on the course. There will be information on the lead car, but I wonder if she's got her supporters and her team, her team members still giving her the information that she needs. But she looks okay for the moment. Here's Tiranesh Dibaba in second place, chasing Mary Katani. Now, Tiranesh looks as though she's running comfortably now. I'm pleased she stopped looking over her shoulder. I'm pleased she stopped weaving from side to side. I hope she gets her drinks a little bit better organized, because in the last stages, the drinks and the, the rehydration is extremely important. But Tiranesh Dibaba, the greatest female Olympian of all time, three times Olympic champion. Nobody's ever done more than that. In the, in the world of female athletics. And this lady is a terrific runner, moving up to the marathon. This is only her second marathon. She was third last year. At the moment, she's second this year. She'll eventually win one. She's such a good athlete. But she says, I'm not giving up on the track. I'm going to be back on the track. Well, here she is on the roads. The one marathon she ran a couple of years ago, 220. Well, she's running well inside that, so she'll be very, very happy. She's being directed on the right-hand side of the road the great sight of the great athlete that is Tiranesh Dibaba. Well, Mary Katani's mile there was 5.20, her slowest of the race. And if she gets, if she, she goes too much slower than that, then certainly Tiranesh Dibaba will start to, at some point, if she keeps going at the pace she's going, will cut into that lead a little bit, but it's a big lead. It's over a minute, uh, but there's still the hard miles to go. There you can see in the distance, St. Catherine's Dock on the left there, that's where the uh, Elite Athletes Hotel is as well. And then they, uh, as they head back towards uh, Tower Bridge, and then they will eventually get onto the embankment. Making the way a little more serenely back at Cutty Sark, the 40,000 who, in many ways, it is about Elite Athletes who, uh, of course, get some of the headlines, but in many ways, it's as ever, all these marathons, big races around the world, it's these thousands of people taking part who produce the spectacle of the event. And wow, well, how about that for a high five? The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge found a good spot there to cheer the, 
all of these people, so many running for the Heads Together campaign, many wearing their headbands. And look at this, the sunshine comes out to welcome them and to help them on their way. All your messages, uh, keep sending them in, by the way. Uh, scrolling across on the bottom. Uh, once the elite race is finished, we'll concentrate a little bit more on some of those stories as well. We'll stay with us all the way through until 3 p.m. this afternoon. Oh, it's Chappers, look. Well, he's meant to be presenting match of the day, too. Excuse me, what time does it start, guys? Is it, was he going to make it? <laughs> he's got plenty of time. Not until half past ten tonight. He's going all right, isn't he? Looks as though he's enjoying it, I think. I tell you what, they should... Uh, you know how in Match of the Day they often use lots of good slow-mo? They don't need slow-mo for Chappers. Bless him. Well, one or two just for me to give a shout-out to. Jess Rudd running for British Heart Foundation. That's her first marathon running in memory of her dad, Rob. Good luck to her. One or two others, first-timers for British Heart Foundation, Amelia. Como and Lucia Kolodinska. And they've volunteered in the past, and you should say a word for the volunteers as well. Thousands of people taking part, but also thousands of people who give up their time and their energy to make these folks have a good and safe day. So important that so many other people give up their time to hand out water, to, to give massage afterwards, to basically the cheering points for all the charities, etc. Um, it's probably more than the 40,000 who actually take part. Yeah, I think we're looking at a slight change in the men's race. We had Kennedy Sabakili pestering the pacemakers, and suddenly, in the course of the last half a mile, the group's changed. The Olympic champion and world record holder has suddenly drifted to the back of the field. I'm looking to see if it's because of the feed station, and he's waiting for a, to get a drink on board. But now we have got a change. There's the group. And there, instead of being at the front of the group and hunting the pacemakers, Kennedy Zabakili is just fading away at the back. Well, that's a shock. It's a bit of a surprise for all as we look at his teammate, Lelessa, the Olympic silver medalist. And suddenly, in the course of a couple of hundred metres, the great one is no longer in the favoured position. He's run at world record pace for half the distance. Is he going to struggle for the next half of the race? He looks to me as though he's going through a real bad patch. Now, can he recover from this? Can he get back on the back of the lead group? I thought he might have been stepping down at 14 miles to get a drink on board, but it doesn't look like that. So the pacemakers are keeping going, they're pushing it along, and the great athlete from Ethiopia, who was always looking as though he was up for today's race, always looking as though the favorite tag that he had beforehand if we can get in a little bit closer to see Kennedy Zabakili as he comes around that corner, then we'll be able to tell by looking at his face. Here's the group coming. And at the back of the group, rather than as he was at the front of the group, Kennedy Zabakili working hard with just a few yards opening. Lelessa in the orange vest, the Olympic silver medalist, the man who represented his country, Ethiopia, and then did a salute to his people, the Oromo people, caused a real political unrest in Ethiopia when that happened has had to now emigrate to the United States because of the trouble he was getting in and his teammate today Kenisa Bakili the world record holder well is he going to be amongst them or have we seen enough have we seen all we're going to see of Kenisa today there's the British athlete Tewelde who's looking yeah. as though he's fading but interestingly for me what was happening in the British race is to Welde, but what was happening at the front of the race is what's happened to Kennedy Sabakili. Yeah, I think Tuelde may well have gone off. He, he did this last year, went off really hard, uh, but told that maybe he was having uh, all of his preparations hadn't gone as well as they might have done for this. He's gone off really quickly again today, but I can tell you that uh, he's now been caught by Andy Lemoncello and Scott Overall. Andy Lemoncello may well be in the best place to finish as the top British athlete, going well. Flagstaff based. Uh, athlete Scott Scott's of course doing so well in their distance running at the moment uh, and in fact to weld himself the Shettleston Harrier so we'll keep you up to date or we'll try to with the men's uh, the British men's 
challenge. But Bakili's got himself back in here. He's got Gabri Celeste. Uh, is alongside him, the world champion in the white, but Kikili's now working his way back into this league group. Some names you do go through a bit of a bad patch. The pace is, is broken up, if you like. He wouldn't want to be where he is, though. He, he'd want to be at the front of this group. The lesser pushing it on, but Bikili hasn't completely gone. There he is, just behind Kuroki uh, in the white vest. And when he dropped back as well, he was hanging his arms straight by the side of him, like he was trying to shake out a stitch or a shoulder stitch or, or something not feeling right. But also, every single one, but particularly the Ethiopian runners in that group, look back and look what had happened. So he could be he's even playing mind games with them a little bit. Let's see what happens if I drop right to the back of this. What will the others do? And then I can knuckle down and work back through it. I'm not saying he's done that because he looks as though he's in a little bit of a difficulty and he's working hard, but he also looks as though he's getting himself through that difficult patch. Yeah, I still think that he'd, he'd want to be... You're right, you can go through a bad patch and come back. Um, but he'd, he'd really want to be up here as Kuroki. And Karui came back to such good form. A lot of people, I guess, have written him off a little bit. Hadn't really run so well over the last two, three years. And then when in Chicago, the pacemakers doing their job here. Uh, it's Lalesa, though, who is hanging on to them, working with them. And uh, Wanjiru, the other Kenyan, Daniel. Lots of running yet to go, though, but Bikili's still in touch, hanging on for the time being. And that's really the best way I can describe it, I think. It is about just hanging on, because all the reports, apart from those last three weeks when we're told he's had a, a few problems, that uh, his preparation had been going well, ready to run fast, and a lot of talk about world record pace, world record challenge, and nobody really thought any of these guys capable of running 2-3. It was only Bikili in the field capable of that. But they're all running very quick indeed and forcing it on here. Meanwhile, so Mary Katani, all on her own, has been since basically mile three and has just gone through 35K, slowing all of the time, has now slipped outside the schedule that would get her under Paula's 2.15.25, so that's not in danger. So she's just going to keep slowing against that schedule from this point. The question is, can she hang on to run under 2.17? Or I would say at the very least that she would want now is that women-only world record of 2.17.42. Predicted time for her at the moment is 2.15.48. I, I suspect she's going to be uh, a fair bit slower than that. Tiranesh de Barber has not really made up much ground. She's picked up a few seconds, but not much. Well, she's already the second fastest female marathon runner. It looks to me as though she's going to end the day as still the second fastest female marathon runner, but she may actually run a personal best time. She may run a Kenyan record. She may run a women's only world record as we look at the athlete who has held world records on the track at 5,000 meters. Won Olympic gold medals at five and 10,000 meters. Is slowly coming to terms of the marathon. A two hour 20 run once before in her only marathon. And here in her second marathon, she's on sh on schedule to run the, could be the third fastest female distance runner, marathon runner of all time. But she's got a little bit to learn in the marathon. She's got to learn about taking drinks on board. She's got to learn about discipline in terms of looking over her shoulder and unbalancing herself. She's here today, she's such a great runner, she's such a class runner in every sense. And the, the leader, Mary Katani, who set up so aggressively, faster in the first half than any female athlete has ever done before. Six kilometers from the finish, so she's well within sight in her mind of the finish and the traditional sight, the great sight of this wonderful female distance runner, Tarinish de Barba looking a little bit more at home in the marathon but says my track career is not over Katani is a roadrunner though well you can see there that's the point at which they come off Tower Bridge to head out to Canary Wharf and Mary Katani heading in the other direction will drop down to the embankment and uh, actually when we have the world championships in London in the summer this will be the start finish of the World Championship Marathon. It's going to be a lap course, very different. Mary Katani has said, I want to be here for that. I'm coming to London uh, to run in the World Championship. 
there is British selection, but there's also Kenyan and Ethiopian selection, apart from anything else going on today. And, uh, well, we may well be seeing her back here in the summer. She had a very disappointing Olympic Games in 2012 after having run so well in the London Marathon on that occasion. And uh, we've got the different uh, IPC uh, categories uh, still running out there. That's Derek Ray. She's moving past there in the men's T45-46. He's in uh, fourth place at the moment with uh, Pires de Silva leading that one ahead of uh, Dohadi El Harti of uh, Morocco and Ifran Sotokuro of uh, Peru as well. But Derek Ray in fourth place in that race. And well, he's, uh, uh, that might just help Mary Katani as well a little bit as some of these athletes ahead that gives you targets, gives you people to work towards. And uh, Mary Katani. Well, both of them getting great support here and the crowds will build as they come down towards the embankment but these are tough miles paula you know they're, they're not so much in terms of but you know you're at that point in the race she's committed she's gone for the time she's running her slowest that she's been running in the race uh, it's hard work she's not that far behind to neshti barber no, she keeps looking behind though, still, even now. But if you contrast the styles, I mean, they're two very different styles of, of runner anyway. Tirana Eshtababa naturally will just bring her heel up much further behind her, much closer to her bum behind her as she's running. And she's got a, a much more of a bouncy stride that, than Mary Katani does. But for me, she, Mary Katani's last mile there, 5.29, so she is tiring. But she will definitely be gaining momentum and gaining hope from these runners as she's catching them, giving us something to focus on, because at this stage in the marathon, you're getting a lot of support, but what you really need to try and do is just stay in the moment. I mean, I've said that so many times to people over the last couple of days, as they've asked me in the expo, what do I need to do when it gets really tough? You just need to think about one foot in front of the other. You don't need to think about even I've got 3.3 miles to go or further back down, those guys going back out around the Isle of Dogs. I'm only halfway. You just think about one step after another, whatever you can do, whatever technique you can do, just to think about that. And that's what she's doing now. And it helps having somebody up the road that she can focus on. It helps having little landmarks that you can pick out. I've got a telephone box, a red telephone box, there's a lot of those along the last bit, along the embankment, but there's one in particular that signifies a mile to go. And we picked that out before I even ran the race, and I used to look for that as I was running along the embankment. It's a little bit easier now because the Millennium Wheel is just opposite it, so you know that you can come across from that. When you turn at Big Ben, 1,200 meters to go, all of those sites will be helping to keep runners going. And there they go through the mini marathon start line as well. There's a few kids started there today, and they'll be starting out on their journey, on their future in running. And then maybe that one of those will come back and, and walk down the course now and see some of the racing going on behind and hopefully grow from there into some great marathon runners in the future. Right, well, that's at the front of the uh, women's race. The British battle at the moment is still being won by Ali Dixon, still running strong, Ali Dixon, beyond two hours. Charlotte Perdue, we think, is a little just further back about maybe 30 seconds that might even be shot i'm just trying to look in the distance there and that could be a real scrap for the two of them joe pavey was in fourth tracy barlow was holding on to the third position um, a few kilometers back we'll get a split through 35k shortly but ali's in about 12th place in the race has passed some of the faster athletes who went off too quick moving her way through and uh, we'll just waiting for her to go through there we can see her personal best 229 30. i think that was set in berlin i think and uh she went off pretty hard that day for much of that race was on 227 pace same as today she slowed a little she's still heading for something between 228 and 229 still a personal best but she needs to hang on but is that charlotte purdue i think it is yes. in the background maybe only 10 15 seconds behind well, well i just counted her through there 16 seconds as they came past uh, past the pedestrian crossing so she is closing in and that might help them too as well as, as charlotte comes alongside ali they will be able to work together and keep each other going i think that looks like is it dulstra <laughs> as well running with charlotte Perdue. so the two of though them have worked together they've got ali in their sights and they're working on from that but ali will also be gaining confidence she knows that she's running a little bit into unknown territory into personal best territory but she knows she's in shape to do that she's making sure that she picks up a drinks bottle which she didn't do um so she'll not be feeling too good about that but hopefully that won't throw her off stride she won't panic she'll just grab a, a water or a lucas aid as she comes into the next feed station uh, and at this stage in the race now it is just about keeping going she's going to see these 
guys in front of her as well that she can work her way through and she will have those targets of the girls that have gone off too fast in this race ahead of her as steve said to, to work on well that's a great race to keep our eye on and that may come to a head in the last two three miles but those two in the best positions in terms of british selection that mary katani here now tired working hard and we'll have to make sure that she concentrates that previous mile slows by a good 10 seconds or about 10 seconds 529 and Tiranesh de Barba isn't so far behind anymore but does she have time to catch her what will they both end up with in terms of a finishing time that 217 42 the official record for a women's only race and it's going to be close meanwhile Brent in the men's in the men's race we've had a shock change in position the world record holder for the five and ten thousand meters as we look at the lead group Kirui still there and Giro is still there Lilesa and Karoki Kenyan athlete who's making his debut today a lot of people thought he would run well in fact Steve said to me before the race I think he might have a chance to win this well Steve you were right he's in amongst it but down the road the two times World record holder, five and ten thousand meters. The man who is trying today, he went halfway. World record pace, and there he is, Kennedy Zabakili, really struggling now. He came to London to try and win this one. The second fastest marathon runner of all time. Now having a lonely battle on his own. He wanted to break the world record, but that's not on today. He at least wants a decent position, but that's going to be under threat but he's working hard he set off so confidently he was in amongst the pacemakers he kept it going he did everything he could he told us i'm up for a race today but his performance in the second half it's falling away and when you miss a bit of training which he has done in the last three weeks even the great one can't do the job and kennedy's a is working so hard struggling for the moment as his countryman lelesa the olympic silver medalist one Giro of Kenya, Kuroki, the debutant, and Kirui, the world, twice world champion. So it's now the four of them. World record pace is halfway. It's not going to be a world record in the men's race today, but they're still, we're looking for a great race. Well, this uphill section coming through the tunnels around Blackfriars, Mary Katani knows it's not too far from here. She's into the last 5K and the sweep of the River Thames taking her towards Big Ben, but not too far behind. But has she got a bit of a stitch problem there? Tiranesh de Barba, who certainly was making inroads into the lead, and she's already on the upslope, but has she got stomach problems there? Just clutching her stomach, yes. I think she's got stomach cramps, and that's a shame because look, I don't think she was that far behind. We've just seen Mary Katani come up this hill. That would have only been, what, 30 seconds ago? So is this falling apart here for Tiranesh de Barba? The two of them were heading for two of the fastest times ever in the marathon. And she's slowing almost to a walk. And I keep saying this, it's these, even for at least these last two, three miles. That's a shame for Tiranesh. She's really laboring now. She's really struggling. Is she going to be able to keep on her route and keep the finish? Well, she's taking the drinks on board. Maybe that's a little bit upset her stomach, but she was going strongly. She was running powerfully. She did have the lead, and there she is, comes to a standstill. The great one, Tiranish de Barba, now walking along the embankment, trying to jog, trying to walk, really struggling, really suffering. Now, she can't have any assistance. She's going to go to the side and maybe get a drink. She may need a drink of water, but she was almost sick if she wasn't sick herself. But now she's off again and trying to run. And down the road, there she is, being, getting rid of whatever it is she's coughing up. You're and trying now, to be polite, aren't you? I, I am trying to be polite, yeah. Steve, for a change. But there, look, she's running properly again. I mean, yeah. that's a, that, obviously a but stomach cramp happens. of some kind. Yeah. You get a cramp like that. It, actually, just as you were watching that, Brendan, I mean, could see by contrast, Katani seems to have picked up again. She's run a 5.26 and a 5.29, slowing down, working hard, but she's, she's kind of... I think realizing I'm there now, I'm nearly there. I'm not going to run as fast as I'd set out to because surely that must have been some sort of game plan because she was going so fast. But she's hanging in, she's hanging on, 
and is still heading for a very, very quick time. She'll be approaching the 40-kilometer point. From that point, just over 2K to go. She'll be looking, well, she won't be looking for Paula's phone box because she won't have probably clocked uh, how significant that is, but she will be clocking off each mile, even kilometres, half a mile here. She doesn't think in miles, so I think she exactly. can only... She'll be following the, the kilometres, but no, I haven't told her about my phone books. That's that's my secret. I've only told a few people watching today and over the last four years about that. Um, but she will she will know the course. I mean, she's run this course many times. She's run very well. She's run her personal best on here. So she will have all of that marked out, but she'll also see those big arches and she'll know what that means when she goes through the 40k which must be coming up sometime around now if she hasn't already gone through it hasn't come up yet on our screens as her having gone through it but certainly i think what happened to, to tiranesh de Barber is when you're take, trying to take on fluids and they need to take on those fluids to get some energy into them on that last stages and then that just that little bit of a slope down and then back up again can sometimes be enough just to shake all that up inside your tummy the blood is already been sent everywhere else and a lot of people get serious stomach discomfort in the last couple of miles uh, and it, it was hard to see her going through that but she has managed to get going again i am looking at her on my screen in a different shot a little bit further down seems to be going through the same stomach spasms again so hopefully she can get through that and keep going she does have a big buffer behind her but she was starting to make significant inroads up on mary katani who now seems to be pulling away again 40 kilometers, 2938. She has picked things up a little bit and she is still heading for something inside 217. And that world record of 217.42 for a women's only race is certainly within sight now. And unless she completely falls apart in the last mile, uh, a 217 clocking or there, thereabouts could well be hers. News very, very quickly from the British fans. We think Joe Pavey dropped out at around 16 miles. We will try and confirm that for you. But Ali Dixon and Charlotte Birdie chasing, trying to get into the top 10 even as well, uh, a little bit further back down the road. But it's now about Mary Katani. How fast can she go here? She is heading towards a personal best for her. She is already, as Brendan said, the second quickest woman ever in the marathon distance, but she's going to improve that time and could yet run the quickest ever marathon in a women's only race. I think Paula should explain to us, Steve, the world record, the world record of 215 and the world women's only world record of 217. Like Paula, just just explain that because I don't think people are going to understand when she crosses the line and they say world record. Can you explain to the public what exactly that's all about? Yeah, I mean, when they started out racing the, the big city marathons, the women went off with the men, and a couple of them stayed with that, and the majority of them, um, New York uh, and London in particular, and Boston, went on to make women's only starts, which means that you run without any assistance from other males running around you. You can't race the men, in effect. So when I broke the world record for the first time in Chicago, that was in a mixed race, a mixed start, and we ran with men, and I ran 2.17.17 17 there, but that was a mixed race. Uh, I then came and improved the world record in London, and I had two um, Kenyan males who ran with us, um, with me, uh, and I was trying to race them, but yes, I, w I was essentially in a mixed race then because they were in the race with me. Uh, and then in 2005, when I ran, I was obviously had no um, other pacemakers. I think I had some women run running with me to about five miles, and then I was on my own from there. And that's what Mary Katani has had today. So she's had some assistance from other pacemakers through halfway, um, but then she's been on her own. Well, Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, West Bridge, Minster Bridge, the scene of such tragedy not that long ago and today the crowds here to cheer on one of the most inspiring sights in world sport the winners of the london marathon and this is your winner here mary katani heading towards as paul has been trying to explain what could well be the quickest marathon ever run by a woman in a women's only race which uh, without that assistance that paula was talking about it's been a Incredible performance for me. Obviously, she went out so hard at a crazy, crazy pace. 
and she could have completely fallen apart. As many have behind her, many big names behind her. They're a long, long, long way behind, including Tiranesti Barb at one point looked as though she could eat into that lead. She certainly had. She got as close as about 40 seconds. That's now extended again to about 70 seconds because she had to stop because of some stomach cramps. She's now back running strongly, but now cannot catch Mary Katani. Despite the surge, she's obviously trying to put in because she now heads into birdcage walk, having come through Parliament Square, around that Westminster area where so many people are watching. Birdcage walk on the left of your screen, that line of trees that heads down towards Buckingham Palace. It's one right turn, and then the monument ahead of them, usually glinting in the sunshine, and then another right turn into the home straight. One kilometer to go for Mary Katani of Kenya. Now, can Mary Katani be only the second athlete to run under two hours and 17 minutes? It's going to be very close. She has recovered from that exuberant start. She went through the first half in 66 minutes and 53 seconds, the fastest time a woman's ever run for the first half of a marathon. She paid for that a little bit. She was the second fastest female of all time going into the race. It looks as though she's going to stay as the second fastest female marathon runner of all time behind Paula, who's sitting alongside us. But she could be running a women's only world record. She could be running the other, the only other athlete to run under two hours 17. It's going to be close. She's less than a kilometer to go. She looks strong now, as she hasn't done for the last few points, but she now knows victory's in sight, a personal best in sight, a Kenyan record's in sight, a women's only world record is probably in sight. So the young lady from Kenya, who's had disappointments at the marathon in the past, she wasn't able to run in the Olympic Games last year, but there she comes along, she'll see the sign, 600 meters ago, a very welcome sign for the Kenyan. Well done so far. So Mary Katani for the past few years has probably, and I put that in inverted commas because you can take it to mean what you mean, probably the world's best marathon run. It's just that she hasn't been able to win the Olympic Games. She ran here in London and found out later that during that race she was actually in the early stages of pregnancy. And that obviously gave an explanation as to why she didn't go so well. But goodness me, she picked it up again here. 4.53 for that last mile to 26 and of course now she's got the point two to go and mary katani heading towards not only a personal best for herself she will join paula radcliffe in running not only sub 218 only paula had done that before on a few occasions mary katani had not been able to she was the second fastest of all time before today, but now heading for a time which perhaps is going to get her under 2.17. She's gonna be very close to that. She needs to make one more turn, and then we'll see the finish line. She's won the London Marathon on two occasions before, but not like this, not this fast, not this good, not this dominant. Mary Katani of Kenya can now sense that history awaits for her. The cheers greet this great Kenyan runner, 35 no years of age, looks a couple of hundred meters ahead. We'll see the clock ticking away. She'll now realize that she's heading for something special. She's heading for something great. What will be her finish time? All on her own. She's been out in front since the first few miles, set a stall out, ran incredibly quick, the fastest ever half marathon. Broke the world record for 30 kilometers and now heading towards a world record for the women's only marathon, Mary Katani of Kenya. Just on 2.17, the official time we'll have to wait for, but we can say that she's broken that record, she's broken her personal best, she's still the second fastest in history, but goodness me, what a performance from her today. A performance of ambition and a performance of strength, not only physically but mentally, those tough miles at the end. And here comes Tiranesh de Barber. She will rise up the all-time rankings, heading for, she will hope to be the third fastest 
marathon runner of all time. She'll break her own teammate's Ethiopian record, Tiki Galana, held that from 2012. So Tiranesh de Barba finishing like the great track athlete we remember her as, sprinting to the line under two hours 18. So Tiranesh de Barba takes a massive leap forward in her marathon career, second in London and the third fastest of all time. Brilliant run from her, despite the stomach cramps in those last two, three miles, when it looked just for a short while as though she maybe, just maybe, could catch Katani. But Katani rallied. Debarba was bent double for a short while, but recovered and has been rewarded with a brilliant performance. History being made in London 2017. A Mary Katani, the brilliant, brilliant, diminutive Kenyan, rewarded for such brave running in the early stages. Well, there's your top two, and they've really pulled this race apart. There are so many great athletes who've suffered behind, including Vivian Chariot in her first ever marathon, not able to stay with this. But who is winning the British race? Who will be the first British athlete to cross the line? For so long, it's been Ali Dixon, the Sunderland stroller, the Olympian from Rio, 38 years of age, Ali, and she set a stall out so early today, went hard early on, but behind her, Charlotte Perdue, the youngest of our contenders. Charlotte still in the early stages of her marathon career. And you know she's been agonizingly close for the last six or seven miles to Ali Dixon. And the gap is closing by about one second every kilometer. And it's now down to about seven or eight seconds. And Paula, this is a great scrap. These two will definitely be coming back for the World Championships in London. And there's a good competition behind them uh, with Tracy Barlow, I think, is still holding the third spot. I mentioned earlier that Joe Pavey sadly had to drop out, but who's going to win between these two? Yeah, great battle between them. The new generation chasing down the old a little bit with Charlotte Perdue working hard there to, to chase down Ali Dixon. They're both going to run, I would say, um, big PBs. Hopefully they will run personal bests. But more than that, I think they've got that lure of being the first British athlete across the line. And with that comes the prize of coming back and competing in a World Championships, representing Great Britain on home soil. And, and nothing can really beat that, to be able to do that on the streets of London. I mean, it's a very, very special experience to run as a British athlete anyway in the London Marathon. But to do that in an Olympic Games, in a World Championships is really special. Yeah, she missed out on selection last year. She actually ran the qualifying time, but the British uh, team had a, a tougher qualifying time than the IWF had set, so she wasn't selected. Rather controversially, some thought, but uh, she said she was in floods of tears in the tent afterwards. Whatever happens here, whether she catches Ali Dixon or not, the two of them will be going, and uh, it's just a question of who perhaps will get the third spot. Tracy Barlow heading for, and she's a great story in herself, Tracy won the mass race last year, six years ago, was running, oh, I don't know, well outside three hours and is now becoming a world-class marathon runner herself. So she could be well heading for world championship selection. I know Charlie, Charlie's mum's here, said she prepared her, brought her down chicken and rice with broccoli. She cooked at home to make sure she got a good meal, wanted her daughter to have a good meal before she set off on today's quest. Run very, very well, heading for a PB. Is she going to catch Ali Dixon? That's what mums do, but there's in third place, coming into less than 400 metres to go. And it looks like Mergia, the Ethiopian athlete, who found herself as the winner, Victor, in the London Marathon a few years ago, when Shobokova was banned after her performance. But she's had a long, hard road, two, 22 minutes on the clock. We've seen two outstanding performances. We've seen the second and third fastest women of all time today. We've seen a women's only world record and we've seen a third place for Ethiopia on St. George's Day, which is also the St. George is also the patron saint of Ethiopia. So second place and third place on St. George's Day. And the reason I know that is because I've just been reminded by John Kane that the best beer in Ethiopia is St. George's beer, and it's named after the patron saint of Ethiopia. 
I wouldn't know. Don't know anything about beer. Well, Merg is very tired. I said that uh, the performance of Katani and Debaba pulled apart this brilliant women's race, and some great runners have really struggled. And in fact, it's meant that uh, the likes of uh, Lisa Waitman of Australia have moved into the top six, we think. Well, those who set out at 224, 225 pace from the start have moved through the field. Joe, uh, sorry, Ali Dixon and Charlie Perdue have moved through the field as well. So 223 for the third athlete across the line. She's very, very tired, Mergia, yeah, and needs a little bit of help there. Well done to her for hanging on. And there are some very tight legs out there. We'll keep an eye on the whole Ali Dixon, Charlie Perdue race. But meanwhile, in the men, former world champion, two-time world champion, Abel Karoui, now with uh, Wanjiru, with a famous name, it's Daniel Wanjiru. The two Kenyans, in fact, three Kenyans, because that looks like Kuroki in third place behind. And this has been a bit of an up and down race, hasn't it, Paula? You know, the pace has been a bit up and down. No Kenanisa Bikili to contest this. Um, as far as we know, Kenanisa is still running. In fact, uh, yes, he is still running strongly. Not that far off this, you know. What, eight seconds, seven seconds? It's not over. It's not over at all. And he actually looks better than he did the last time we saw him, where he looked as though he was really struggling to, to, to maintain his form and to maintain his pace. Now, certainly from behind, he looks like there's more bounce there, there's more control there. There's still that frown of concentration on his face, but he doesn't look as though he's in as much difficulty as I would have said he was the last time that we saw him. Back at the front there, an interesting story. So Abel Karui, I remember when he first committed to, to running the London Marathon just as Ranjuri has moved ahead and, and gained a little bit of a gap on him. He actually said, I'm not that bothered about the prize money, but if I win it, can I go up in the space rocket, please? I don't know you can arrange that these days, can't you? I think you could, Steve. But uh, that was really interesting because Kennedy Zabakili, about five, three or four miles ago, looked as though he was out of it completely. As he now look at Wanjiru, who won the Amsterdam Marathon. He ran earlier in the year, didn't run very well in a half marathon. And Karui is really working hard now to try and get close to him. Lilesa, the Olympic silver medalist, I think is in third place. And again, the gaps are... They're not huge by marathon distance standards. One hour 40, they've got 20 minutes, just over 20 minutes of running left. And the race now is certainly on. Who's going to win this one? Can Wanjiru, is this a winning break? Can Lisa Bakili is coming back in fourth place now. Well, he's gone through a really bad patch, but he is a great athlete. I'd written him off earlier. I hope it's to my peril, because it would be wonderful if the great man could, could actually come through and come through quickly. So there's Wanjiru, and there, just as Wanjiru turned the corner, here comes Kennedy Zapakili with a new spring in his step. He's working hard, he's clearly applied himself, because at some points in races, Kennedy sometimes can switch off and lose it and throw it away completely. But there, he's got the sight of the leader. He's looking down the road, he sees several vests ahead of him, but he sees the leader, Wanjiru, ahead of him. He then sees Lilesa, he also sees Karui, but fourth place, Kenanisa Bakili. Now, are we going to see a startling change in this men's marathon? Well, today is about the Leeds, of course. Brazil is about winning a place on the British team. I can tell you in the men's race, as far as Britain's concerned, it's been all changed. Johnny Meller having a great run. So is Robbie Simpson, Scott Overall, all in with a chance still. But... In the women's, it's Ali Dixon again. She finished ahead of Sonia Samuels last year in the Olympic trial. Effectively, the London Marathon is the trial for the major championships. It was the Olympics last year. It's the chance to run for Great Britain in front of this home crowd in London in August in the World Championships. And the Sunderland stroller, 38 years of age, is trying to hang on, is trying to hold off Charlie Perdue. And Charlie has been trying her best to catch Ali, but she hasn't really been able to make inroads into that lead. It's been stuck at about 10, 11 seconds for the last seven or eight miles. She's picked up a couple of seconds, but no more than that. 
And Ali, well, you know her well, Paula, I know her really well. Her dad's here, her family's here. Her dad was a, a pretty good Sunland Harrier as well. And the whole of the Northeast will be loving this. But she's a tough, tough cookie, isn't she, Ali Dixon? She is, uh, and I know her well, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but she's knackered now. She's really trying to get everything that she can out of her legs and she'll know that Charlie's closing on her but she'll also know how tantalizingly close she is to her personal best because we're in certain stages in this race she's been up on that 227 pace now she's she's going to be just around that 229 her personal best is 229.30 or thereabouts Charlotte Purdue is also going to run a personal best so at least she will have that but she's been tantalizingly close to Ali closing and closing on her they'll see, uh, run under that big bridge there as Charlotte's just come through the shadows which says 385 yards to go that significant extra distance added onto the marathon all of those years ago and one more turn now along here one more turn and then she'll see the finishing gantry and she'll see the clocks up there so she'll be aware that she can beat her personal best but she also wants to be the first British runner home so Ali Dixon of Sunderland Last year, this was to gain selection for Rio and the Olympic Games. She was so pleased to do it on that day. She'll now have her eyes on that clock ahead of her. As Paula said, her personal best is 2.29 and 30 seconds. I think she's going to break that. Go on, Ali, last few metres. Charlie Perdue is heading for a sub-2.30 clocking as well. Ali Dixon may be a little emotional here. What a great run. There's the smile. Ali Dixon does the Barini, if you don't know what that is. That's a trademark finish. Personal best, 12th place, I think, for Ali Dixon. And what a run from Charlie Perdue. Still learning the marathon. She's going to run under two hours and 30. A personal best for her, too. She's going to be back in London for the World Championships, I'm pretty sure, as well. The selectors, I'm sure, will make that decision tomorrow and we're waiting to see who the third british athlete is last i looked it was tracy barlow and she could well be joining these two joe pavey sadly had to drop out so we'll be waiting for tracy perhaps to be coming through in the next uh, two three minutes but in the meantime let's see what's happening in the men's race and what i can tell you as these two celebrate and let's just have a look at ali here Boom. Well, that's a reward for all those hard miles, the tough miles. Everybody puts them in, don't they? But it's a great feeling when it all comes together like that. Well done to both of them. Right, after all that excitement, more to come. More to come in the men's race. Our leader was Daniel Wanjiru, recent winner, well, winner last year of the Amsterdam Marathon. This would be the biggest win, though, of his career, definitely a, a talent. But in the distance, in the distance, the figure of Kenanisa Bikili is looming. Bar uh, Kuroki is in second place, it looks as though, in the moment. I think Bikili, there he is, he's third now. He's chasing. Kenanisa Bikili being cheered by the... Runners going in the opposite direction. He's the one they recognize. He's the one they know. There's still plenty of miles here for Kenny. Plenty of time for him to catch Wanjiro. Wanjiro looks good, Bren, but he's moving well now. He's moving much better, Bikili. He looks altogether different than he did a few miles ago. He's now got a determination in his eye. He's hunting them down. He's moving through in third place. This isn't the way he would have chosen to run this marathon. He was threatening the pacemakers at the early stage. He was wanting to go for a fast one. He's now got some idea that he's going to get a position here. Can he? He's going to take over. He's going to move into second place very, very quickly. He's running faster than anyone else at this stage. Now, look at this. Here comes the great Kennedy Zabakili. And Steve said that people recognize him from either side. Well, so they should. He is one of the greatest of all time. We've been privileged to watch his career, and I've been lucky. His first ever international race was at the cross country in Newcastle in the early 2000s. And at the, de at the time, we were told by, by Haile Gebri Selassie that this man was going to be good. Well, we didn't realize how good he was going to be, but here he is, moving into, into second place moving quickly and that's the skill of marathon running and distance running on the roads when you see the athlete you want to pass 
go past him quickly, don't look either side, and there he is now, moves into second place. Great drama in the men's race, and we saw the top two women cross the line for Great Britain in uh, under 2.30, and I can tell you, not far behind them, we thought the third place was going to go to Tracy Barlow. Hopefully we'll show you Tracy in a second or so, but Wanjiro looking behind, knows where the threat is coming from. Big crowds, lots of cheers, and I know at the front it's one thing, but here's somebody who knows what it's like to have won the mass race. Tracy Barlow, what a story for her, has got better and better through her career. Started out with all of those other people at the back, even last year she didn't get the chance to run from the elite start. She's done it this time, and I think that run will cement her a place. That's a big personal best for her. She's run personal best galore over the last few years, and that is another big step forward. Congratulations to her third British athlete home and could well be selected for the World Championships. So here we go then, the tower. He knows that that means there's not far to go, and he's on the hunt here, he's chasing down Wanjiro. Whatever went on in that middle section, whatever happened to him, he's able to put that now to the back of his mind. But can he close that gap? Plenty of time, but as we saw with Charlie Perdue and Ali Dixon, it's one thing thinking, yeah, I've got time to do it, but he's moving well now. He's gliding across the streets of London, with his eyes, keeps looking up, doesn't he, Brent? Just flicks his eyes up, looks at the gap, looks at the man in front of him and thinks, right, I've got you. There are two Kennedys of Achilles, you know. Sometimes in the middle of a race he gets depressed and he doesn't actually apply himself. And other times, at his very, very best, he is the greatest. Now, and back in the, somewhere in London, his manager, Jos Hermans, who's done a brilliant job coaching him back from injury, from illness, from disillusionment, from the fact that he's not been able to compete as he used to do on occasion. And there's Wanjiro now, he is hunting him down. Has he left it a bit late? Well, there's no one more powerful in distance running. Barry Fudge, who's Mo Farah's advisor, was telling me that there's nobody as they come through 23 miles. There's no athlete that he's ever worked with who's got the engine, as he calls it, the capacity to, to uh, work and run as quickly in endurance running as Kennedy Zabakili can. Now he's drifting down that hill. He's actually really, really flying. He's really motoring, and this is a wonderful sight. Kennedy Zabakili, not at his very best, because I don't think this is his very best. I think he is capable of running a world record in the marathon, but he looks as though there's been two athletes in this race, and the one that we really want to see is this one. This is the great Kennedy Zabakili, and you wouldn't bet against him at this point. No, and I think the significant thing, uh, Bren and Paula, was that you, you saw that caption come up, uh, which is about the leader, and it said five minutes for his last mile. And that's not quick enough at this point, really. I know that, you know, the, Paula will tell you which are the quick miles and which are the slow miles, but if Kenny's running 450, he makes up 10 seconds, and 450 is kind of what you expect. Elliot Kipchoge, you know, in his last two miles last year, was running under 440. So that gives you an idea. So all Kenny needs to do is to keep running 445, 450 here towards the finish, and he's going to catch him. I think we can see he's going to do that, isn't he? In fact, he may well catch him in the next three, four minutes. I hope he does. I really hope he does. You're not supposed to be biased when you're sitting in the BBC commentary box, but he's been an athlete who I've got to know over the years. I literally remember him coming to Newcastle and beating Paul Turgot. We'd never heard of him, and highly Gabriel Selassie rang me up and he said, he's going to be good, this guy, you know, give him a chance. We gave him that chance, he beat Paul Turgot in that cross country, and I remember saying that we'll see and hear a lot more of him. I'd love him to win this today. It would be a fantastic occasion if he could. I'll tell you what, a few miles ago, you wouldn't have given Tuppence for his chances, but now Wanjiru realises there's a race on. Now, has he got anything left? We don't know the answer to that. Has Kenanisa got enough power to drive, to take some support from this crowd? There's still plenty running left in this marathon, but marathons are dramas, and this is the drama of the marathon unfolding. Wanjiru's been close to the leaders all the way, and here's Kenanisa hunting him down. Kenanisa's confidence must be rising, Paula. 
Yeah, and the significant moment is going to be, for me, when Bikili goes past Wanjiru here. Does he just go straight past him, which he should do? Just blow straight past him and keep on driving towards the finish. Don't settle in and don't make it into a little bit of a race because that gives Wanjiru just a little bit of hope that, OK, maybe he's really tired as well. But if you go straight past and you go past hard, it really destroys the confidence of the runner being passed. And Wanjiru at the moment, he must know that Bikili is closing on him. People in the crowd will be saying that he may even be able to have some of his supporters some of his um, support network out there along the road giving him information he may be able to hear his manager he might be sitting in the car in front but um he will know that someone is chasing him you can see that kenanisa bikela obviously going through some of the ethiopian support there have uh, come out to, to support him and he's given them some thanks and not as tired, certainly, as Rodjura is in front. If you can raise your arms at that stage in the marathon and wave, then you've still got something left. Having said that, although he looks much smoother and he looks as though he's running, running much better, that gap is not really closing. Well, I'll tell you what, Paula, a couple of miles ago, he couldn't have, re he couldn't have raised one arm, let alone wave, wave of both hands. But, you know, he's waving a little bit early because he... You don't wave in second place. You <laughs> wait till you come down the mile in first place before you think about w waving. But Kenanisa Bikili, one of the greatest athletes of all time. In my view, there are two of the greatest of all time, and they're both currently active. Mo Farah will be seeing later in the summer. Kenanisa Bikili, we're seeing today, trying to write the record books in the marathon. Can he win this marathon today? Here he comes. One. Wanjiru looking over his shoulder. He's not very efficient either looking over his shoulder, but he knows it's coming from behind the threat. OK, so he didn't know. That look over the shoulder there said that he definitely did not know before now that it was Kenanisa Bikila closing on him. So that race is, well, it's going to keep developing, isn't it? I mean, we, they've got, what, another... So 11 minutes, we're heading for around about 2.5, something like that, around about 11 minutes perhaps of running and about 11 seconds to close. So a second every minute, that's the way to look at it. Right, so here we go. I know who my money's on in a sprint finish. <laughs> it's one thing saying that, you know, the end of marathons, despite your track career, you can't always raise a sprint finish. Just to, uh, before we really get into this, just very quickly on the British, uh, race, if you like. I can tell you that Robbie Simpson, the D-side runner, is heading for a massive personal best at the moment, and he's ahead of Johnny Meller, coming off uh, his latest personal best of a half marathon, heading for a big run, and Scott Overall, they're the top three British men at the moment, about seven minutes behind Kenanisa Bikili, who just looks ahead, sees this little rise, sees that that gap is closing but it's not closing quickly it's just what tantalizing isn't it when you get that close to somebody and you think yeah i've got you and then all of a sudden maybe that look behind another look behind there paula is he rallying wanjiru is he trying to push on and uh, give kenanisa bikili some doubts well, you know, he looked behind and there was that look of shock on his face when he saw that Bikili was closing on him. And then he stuck his head down and he moved much quicker. So maybe he had just backed off a little bit, thinking, I I've got this, I'm away, I'm clear. And then he's looked around and thought, oh, no, I'm not. I've got a little bit more work to do yet. But he's not done yet, Manjira, I think. Bikili also is not done and he's chasing and chasing hard. But Wanjiri had something left there. He saw the traffic lights turn to green there as the leaves and the, the petals actually falling down there from the side, from fans on the side. And Wanjiru, well, we don't know how quick he is at the finish. We've never seen him as this com this competitive in a really true international event. Has he got a sprint finish? We don't know. But here comes Kenanisa Bakili. He's hunting down this man. But I would, I'm getting very nervous for Kenanisa. I just wish he would do it a bit quicker. We know how quick he can be in the last couple of hundred meters of a race, but he's a marathon now. This is different. Tell you what, Brent, as well, Karaki is not far behind the two of them. In the long shot, you can just see the orange vest of, I think it's Karaki, yeah. making his way back towards them. Well, they've got less than three kilometres to go. There was a little sign saying um, 39 kilometres, and it's, a, it's three and a bit from there. So they've now, in, in his career, he ran 3K and 7.25. He'd, he'd swap that now, wouldn't he? He'd, 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 anything close to that. <laughs> but he's, he's got some work to do here, Bren, and he's he's got to time it right, you know. It, it, it's what, probably, I, last I did a little count, was about eight seconds. And you can still catch that in the last 
seven, eight hundred meters, but you've got to be able to pick up in the marathon. That's you just it's not so easy to do that. It's not so easy to do, Steve. And he you know, he could pick it up in the last eight hundred meters, but we don't know how quick Wanjiro is. I mean we've seen great athletes from Ethiopia, we've seen great athletes from Kenya, we've seen lots of them with outstanding sprint finishes. We've seen Kenanisa run from a long way out. We've seen him sprint quickly with a lap to go in big races. But those days of, of, of track running, some of them, some of his very, very fastest times are behind him. He's now a marathon runner. The gap is not necessarily closing here. We have a true drama. This is a man who wants to win it, who wants to win a big one for the first time. The man in second place has won many, many big ones. He's even run, he's even won a big marathon in Berlin. Now, can he win this one today? This is really, really, really dramatic, really exciting. My hopes are with Kennedy, sir, but you wouldn't know. When Jira looks at his watch, I wonder whether he's just looking at the time of day. Well, it, the one thing it won't tell him is that he's actually extended his lead by two seconds just in the last 400 meters. It's gone from eight seconds to 10 seconds. And that's not good news for Kennedy Sabakili. The only other thing you could say is, is Wanjiru pushing a little bit too early, but he looks okay, he looks comfortable, and Kenny's got to find something here. He's got to be able to somehow lift his cadence. Easier said than done at this point of a marathon. He's already looking behind. Maybe, as Paula says, he's aware that Kuroki's not too far. But 10 seconds, they're going to both take their last water on board here, and that's a good thing to do. But there goes... Wanjiru got his safely. Kenanisa looking for his drink. There it is. Got it. And you get that down you, and then you go, if you can. Yeah, and last surge. And we talk about mind games in the marathon, and it probably is. I mean, it's, it's very apt that it's sponsor, uh, sponsored, and the headline charity is Heads Together this year, because it, you need to have your head together to, to run strong in the marathon. And there are a lot of mind games at play here. The fact that Kenanita Vakili is working as hard as he can, and he's not closing that gap, is one strike against him. The little look back that Wanjiru just threw over his shoulder was one strike back for Kenanita Vakili, because he sees, OK, you know, you're struggling. You're worried about me. Uh, I know I'm not making up yet, but maybe I can still make it up if I can still keep working away. And both of these guys are just absolutely focused again, as we spoke about, as that one foot in front of the other and just try and maintain the pace, try and pick it up just a tiny bit, break down this last mile and 385 yards into tiny little sections. 25 miles. This is a brave attempt to try and win it from Wanjiru. I don't know if he knows it's Kandinisa Bakili. He may do, because he did look shocked when he looked over his shoulder. But this is not a, it's a tantalizing gap, about nine seconds. They've got about three or four minutes of running left. And Kandinisa Bakili, when I'm looking at him, I'm, I am a bit biased, and I'm sorry to say that, but I am. I'd, I'd love to see Kandinisa win this one, but my real heart is saying, come on, Kandinisa, hurry up a bit, hurry up a bit. Well, I think he is, Pren. I mean, I keep doing some mental while you guys are chatting there, just using a lamppost or other. It's eight seconds. So it's gone from eight to ten to nine, back to eight. And so this isn't over. You know, he's, he's close enough to strike. He's close enough to worry Wanjiru as we go past midday. And Big Ben looking down on a great race yet again. Can Kennedy Sabakili close? on Daniel Wanjiru. Wanjiru trying to win his biggest ever race. I don't know why Wanjiru looks at his watch, because there is the biggest clock, the most famous clock in the world, perhaps. Tells him what time it is. It's one minute past 12, mate. And you've got another four minutes or so of running. But behind you is perhaps the world's greatest ever distance runner. Perhaps the man who one day will break the world record. It certainly won't be today. His job today is to try and close eight seconds of tarmac between him and Daniel Wanjiru. Wanjiru turns that corner. Now he's got a long run and Kenanisa leans into the corner. And you can see that he really is having a go. This gap may be a little bit too much for him. You just feel like you want to see Kenanisa back to his track running days where he starts to run. 52 seconds for the last 400 meters. He looks as though he's gearing up to do that. He looks as though he's gearing up for a finish. Seven seconds, according to my mathematician friend, Steve Cram here, telling me there's seven seconds to go. Paula, what's your view? 
Well, you know, seven seconds doesn't sound that much, and people are going to say seven seconds. Over the course of the marathon distance, surely he can make that up. But if I tell you that he's only gained five seconds in the last 5K, up to from 35 to 40K, that shows you the enormity, because he's got less than two kilometers. He's probably got approaching one kilometer now to make that up in. He is capable of doing it, but this race means a lot to both of them, and it's who wants it more at this stage. Six seconds now. It's nothing, is it? Six seconds. What can you do in six seconds? Nothing. Can't even tie your laces. But for Kenny Sabakili and for Daniel Wanjiru, it's the difference between first and second. For one, it could be the biggest day of his career so far. For the other, it will cement his stature as one of the great, perhaps the greatest ever distance athlete. Can he come back from a tough period in this race to win the London Marathon? Heading down Birdcage Walk disappearing under the trees the crowds here are massive and that's it a gap which is now down to about four or five seconds it's closing all the time it's closing all the time and kenanisa bakili the great one looks as though he's moving into the track mode his, his cadence has increased he's lifting he's looking like the kenanisa bakili that we see running 52 53 seconds for the last lap of a 400 meter of a, of a 10,000 meter race but the gap is still there we can see them both together the bikes are showing us that there's a gap there's still a gap there kenanisa has got to work and he's got to literally lift his body move into sprinting mode get ready to do that when Giro looks over his shoulder he's being hunted by the greatest of all he's being hunted by a man who's finished strongly in many many races he's being a Hunted by a man who's been a privilege to observe over the last few years. I wonder, has he got one last effort? Can he dig one out? Come on, Ken Lisa. I shouldn't say that. Well, that gap has just extended by another second or two again. And you know, those of us who watch track and field athletics over the years, you always say that when it comes to a sprint finish, the Ethiopian will always outkick the Kenyan. But today, I fear that's not going to be the case for Kenanisa Bikili because Daniel Wanjiru takes another look behind. He's found something a little bit extra. 427 for that previous mile. And it may well be the Bikili as he takes one last look behind for the first time. Instead of concentrating on ahead, that gap is now an insurmountable one for even the greatest. Even for Kenanisa Bikili, he can't close that now. You cannot lift your legs to a track finish. finish in the same way, I have over 10,000 meters in the marathon. It just doesn't happen. So let's look at Daniel Wanjiru. Kenya have had some great champions, some great names, and he wouldn't have been the favorite if you looked down the list today, but he showed when he won the Amsterdam Marathon that he's got massive potential. His best, he's only going to be just outside it today, is two hours, 5.21. And sometimes these days people sniff at those sort of times, but that is phenomenal running. And so Daniel Wanjiru, carrying a famous name, the great Sami Wanjiru, Olympic champion, of course, no longer with us, but Daniel Wanjiru today. It's his day, his race, his London Marathon. He's held off the best. He's held off Kenanisa Bikili, and now he can enjoy his moment. Arms aloft, Daniel Wanjiru will win the 2017 London Marathon in fine style. Congratulations to him. Kennedy Sabakili tried his best, tried everything he knew, dug himself out of a bad patch, but it wasn't enough on the day. Has to settle for second spot. Great race between these two. No quarter given, non expected. Wanjiru and Bakili. Not the fastest of London marathons, but what a great race they gave us. And I think Paula made the point on a day when we're talking about mental health, heads together, uh, in, in their different ways, they showed how much mind over matter can work here. Wanjiru, the biggest win of his career. And goodness me, whatever happens in the rest of his life, he'll say, that was the day I beat Kenanisa Bikili. That was the day I held off the greatest. So, there's our winner. Kenanisa Bikili taking second. We're just waiting for the third place runner 
to come in. It was Bidan Karoki, and he's just coming into the mall in front of us here. And that's a great marathon debut for him because he set off at a very, very fast pace. He's very tired. He's got to keep going to the finish. He's just being chased. I think he's just about going to hang on. Abel Karui, his teammate, the former world champion, chasing him in. But Bidan Karoki, great career in cross country, very good half marathon runner. His first marathon's been a hard one. Goodness me, elite runners can look as tired as anybody else at the end, but he drags himself across the line for third in his first marathon in London. And, uh, well, he'll be one of those walking rather awkwardly tonight, and tomorrow he'll be joined by about 40,000 others. So Karui takes fourth. Two tough races today, really tough races. And there's some big gaps again in the men's race, similar to the women's, where even the best in the world, if they go out too hard, if they push too hard early, can pay the penalty. The distance is always king. The marathon always comes out on top. It's always a test. It doesn't matter who you are. So Daniel Wanjiru and Kenanisa Bikeli. They looked uh, pretty good at the end, didn't they? Karoki just about staggering to the finish line. Oh, and we're just waiting to see the fifth place runner coming through. I think I'm just trying to see if Gabby Selassie had come through the uh, youngster, but it wasn't him. Just coming in is uh, Simbu from Tanzania, having a pretty solid run. Paula's happy because she's a big fan of his. He's going to be just outside two hours and nine. So Simbu finishing pretty strongly. Well done to him. We'll try and uh, give you an update on the British race. It was uh, a bit of a surprise going on there. Robbie Simpson was uh, still leading the British challenge. Don't forget, only two spots available for the British team because they've already pre-selected Callum Hawkins who's had such a brilliant year last year and this year. And uh, as they went through 35K, Johnny Meller and Robbie Simpson, uh, in fact, Johnny Meller had gone ahead of Robbie Simpson at 35K. They were in the leading two spots. So there are only two spots available for British selection. As we see, Gabriel Selassie, the uh, world champion, surprised everybody, didn't he, in the heat and the humidity of Beijing ran well in Rio, just missed out on a medal in Rio and he finished in fourth place there and he's tired today. I'm sure he's got a fast time in him, this guy. Still has only run around 2.7. He just needs to judge his race a little bit better. So I can actually just give you an update on that. Robbie Simpson has uh, gone through 40K. Isn't that far from the finish? And don't forget, the qualifying time was 2.16, but most of the British athletes had already uh, done that, and there was a really case of who finishes in the top two positions today. Well, back at the tower, not yet halfway and as we've completed uh, some of the elite athletes one or two others still obviously will uh, keep an eye on that british story in the men's race watch for them finishing but it's now about the thousands of others for whom the day is not even half over yet for those who are crossing tower bridge that's a big landmark not only in terms of being able to see it but it marks the point where you cross from south to north and it's not too far, is it? It's only halfway, pretty much guaranteed to get to the finish line. I, I'm always amazed now by the fact that hardly anybody drops out, and so well done to everybody. It's a great sight every single year, inspires more and more. So many people, something like getting on for a quarter of a million people apply to run in the London Marathon every year and around 50,000 or so get acceptances and then some of them for whatever reason can't come on the weekend so around 40,000 registered this week to take part picked up their numbers and these are the guys who've made it to canary wharf so far sun's coming out 
temperature rising, but it's pretty good conditions. Nice day, beautiful day in London. Great crowds as ever. And we'll continue to bring you those stories and mention a few people who are out there running for all of the great causes. Don't forget, I'm sure most of you are very well aware that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry have been out there themselves supporting people, all those raising money for the Heads Together campaign. Quick mention to a couple out there who I know are running. Charlie Gaynor running for Child Rescue in Nepal and Melanie Wells running for St. Catherine's Hospice, aiming for around three and a half hours, so she won't be uh, too far away. Excuse me, Andrea Morgan running for Bernardo's has never, ever run the 26 miles. So many people doing it for the first time, but I'm pretty sure they're all going to get round safely. If I can give a shout out to all of the runners for Asthma UK, raising money out there, they're doing a great job. Heidi DeLove for Children with Cancer, running and raising a lot of money for them. Ellie Hunt, MSA, Elidia Campbell, 60 years old, running her 49th marathon, 20th London marathon. I hope she's going well. The popular running club in Loughborough. And Claire Connor, running for the brain tumour research, as well as Kat Descendis, running as Gingerbread Man. Nicholas Schimmel running for the Lincoln and Knotts Ambulance, Air Ambulance, and Stephen Oates running for action for ME. And four people from our office in Newcastle, Alice Milligan running for Asthma UK, Rachel Phillips running for Get Kids Going, Joe Milner running for Alzheimer's in memory of his grandmother, and Sarah Bull running for St. Gemma's Hospice in Leeds. Good luck to those. And Carolyn White, Connor Maxwell, Andy Falkgen, all running for British Legion, Autism and Break for Kids. Sam Lupton, who's already raised £3,000 from Bucket Collections in the West End, recently played Seymour in the Little Shop of Horrors and went round after the show collecting money. Well, this is really interesting because I'm just looking at him. That's Robbie Simpson, who's running very well, but there's an athlete ahead of him wearing 1154, which might, who might have been in the mass race. This is Simpson, who needs to run, uh, well, could well be Josh Griffiths. I just need to check that. There he is. Now, this could be a real surprise here, because in the same way that Tracy Barlow did it last year, what a performance from him. That's under 215, and he could well be the first British athlete across the line, could well join Callum Hawkins, there's Simpson, he's run under the qualifying time. That'll be a new personal best for him. At one time, he was heading for something around 2.13. Johnny Meller as well was in the mix there. So lots of athletes coming across the line who were in that 2.14, 2.15 mix. But goodness me, what a performance from him. It's a day when, of course, the elites get the chance on the elite start line uh, to have their name and their, their rep, but there are others out there who can put in the big performances on the day, and he certainly has. Yeah, I'm just looking at his time. He's there, holding Steve. his head. He can't believe what he's done today. 2:14:49, Steve, for Josh Griffiths. Uh, I and mean, how often does that happen to a three A's runner, a club runner? I mean, a very, a, a brilliant club runner. Your nips in ahead of those that were expected from the actual pure elite stars and gets in there ahead of Robbie Simpson. Incredible performance. Yeah, as I mentioned, Tracy Barlow doing it last year on 2.32. You have, like you could go back to Tracy Griffiths, was it? We're a long way back. Um, yeah, Tra uh, Morris, exactly. Tracy Morris, excuse me. But well done. Well done, Josh. He must have passed Robbie Simpson really in the last mile or so if, if because Robbie was definitely leading Brit and uh, Johnny Mello was up there as well I can see Scott overall just heading into the finishing straight ahead of me well that's one for the selectors that's a really interesting one could he could this man here be representing Great Britain in the world championships in London this summer what a story that would be well he well, should think, shouldn't he yeah should shouldn't he because if he, he's finished in the first two British athletes 
this is the official trial. He's got the qualifying time. So I can't see that they can't pick him. And he, he's, he's had a great run on top of that. So he can only build on that going into the summer. Let's just pick him up, Paula. You and I will pick him now. Yeah, we could do a better job than the selectors anyway, <laughs> couldn't we? Well, for Josh Griffiths, what a day it's been for him. And, you know, we talk about the elites and all the great stories, but I love it when something like that happens. Swansea Harrier, and, you know, the London Marathon in the early days, Brendan, you've been here for 37 years. We're going to hear a little bit more about some of your memories later on. But, you know, when this race started, it was club runners as well who really made this. Your running has become something which you and I have loved watching over the years and so many people are taking part. But for club runners still, it's great that somebody like that can come through. And perhaps, who knows, I hope anyway, the selectors will confirm he will run in the World Championships this summer. Well, that's the great thing about running is nobody has to say how good you look or how which club you're in or, or or what you've been doing but you just have to go out there it's a true democracy because if you're good enough and you train hard enough and you're fast enough then you should get selected and i think that's absolutely right so in amongst those elite athletes we've seen british athletes at the four we've seen athletes being selected for the world championship Fowler and i've just selected some of them so uh, at the end of the day that's what the sport's about and this is wonderful but doesn't Lon honestly london responds every year look at the look at the sh those shots they are magnificent our capital city in all its glory being populated by runners from one end of the city to the other all the traffic's come to a standstill we've seen great athletics we've seen great performers and now the spirit of the london marathon takes over and the human spirit we'll see plenty of in the next couple of hours. We'll see people running for their own reasons, to run quick. We'll see people running to, to prove to themselves that they can do it. We'll be seeing lots and lots of people raising money for charity. We've got the Heads Together charity featuring extremely prominently today through the Royals. But we've got people out there running for other charities. Tomorrow's people being represented by Mark Holmes and Amanda Laurie running for Macmillan Cancer Research. Worthy, worthy charities in every sense. And all the runners from the Isle of Man today are all wearing ribbons in memory of Murray Lambden, who has passed away a few days ago. He was Mr. Athletics on the Isle of Man. He kept the sport going over there. And these guys are paying a real tribute to him, as well as Beth Barrett Wild running for Cancer Research and Lance O'Meara running for the Great Ormond Street Hospital, Scott Malone running for Whiz Kids, and I've got plenty of people to mention, and there are a few of them, but including out there today, David Dinsmore running for Chance, Chances for Children Appeal, and the Buttle UK charity helps children and young people at the crossroads of their lives, at the crisis points, and to get some financing to help them do what they want to do. And number 6003, aiming for 335, Warwick Shepherd running for the Children's Heart Unit in Newcastle. Well, what a story in the elite races. I'm still talking about Josh Griffiths. That's his first marathon. That was his debut at the marathon distance. He ran a PB over the half marathon, I think, earlier this year. But that's what a way to start your marathon career. Has he run himself in the British team? We think so. What a story that is. I'll tell you what, we have to give a bit of thanks as well for that tip to, to Derek Hawkins, who was obviously following Josh Griffiths' progression through this race uh, and let us know that he was moving so strongly through that field. And, of course, he joins Derek's brother, Callum, on the team. And many of the guys who will have come through the British ranks will know Bud Baldaro very, very well. So Bud's son, Jamie, is out there raising money for Parkinson's UK and for Bud's run. So we hope Jamie's going well as well. Well, we had a couple of great races, and we had a world record in the women's elite race, and we had a fantastic race in the uh, men's as well. Daniel Wanjiru beating Kenini Serbikili. And that victory for David Weir as well, and the uh, seventh victory for David Weir in the men's wheelchair race, Manuela Shah. In, uh, in the women's wheelchair race, very different uh, races, and we'll be rounding up all of those uh, elite races in just a few moments' time, but uh, the Masses head out, still heading out towards uh, Canary Wharf and the big loop around there, then we'll come back 
and uh, some very weary legs down the embankment and round into the mall. But they are the towers of Canary Wharf uh, calling them in. And beautiful conditions for running today. It is getting a little bit warmer here, certainly in our commentary box at the start of the mall. By Buckingham Palace, it is uh, it is heating up, but uh, the sun is out, it is shining. Not much breeze around, but it's cool enough. I think the ideal temperature, Paula would tell me better than I could, uh, the, the ideal temperature for running marathons, 15, 16 degrees? Um, well, some prefer colder. I would say cooler would be would be better temperatures there. I mean, it's getting a little bit warm now. For the masses out there, just please make sure that you... Oh, well, obviously can't hear me now, but gave them enough advice over the last couple of days to keep taking on enough fluids because once the direct sunlight comes out as well, you've had the shelter from the breeze because there's a lot of runners around you and there's a lot of support out there. So at the start, perfect conditions. Now it's getting a bit warm. So, as we mentioned in the men's wheelchair race, what a finish it was. David Weir down the mile, just out sprinting. Marcel Hoog, the favourite, the defending champion, but it was London Marathon victory number seven for David Weir, and what a way to win it. In the women's, a very different story, a comfortable win by over two minutes for Manuela Shah, the uh, Swiss athlete, winning for the first time after being runner-up for the last three years. History was made in the women's elite race. Mary Catani breaking the world record for the women's only race. Two hours, 17 and one second. And Tiranesh de Barber chased her home to become the third fastest female marathoner of all time. It was a brilliant, brilliant performance. And in the men's race, Daniel Wanjiru. Not a name you'll know, not a name you'll recognize. The biggest day of his career. He's won the Amsterdam Marathon before, but today it was his day in London as he held off the charging Kenanisa Bekele. He beat the greatest on what must be his greatest day. Not the fastest of races, but a cracker. This is how they finished in the... Uh World Para Athletics Marathon World Cup, the wheelchair race for the T53 54s. And David Weir, there it is, number seven ahead of Marcel Hook, with Rafael Jimenez taking third place. And in the women's, a big victory as expected, without Tatiana McFadden, the American who couldn't make it over for this one. A big victory for Manuela Shah ahead of Amanda McCrory and Susanna Scaroni. Those were the three expected to fill the top three places, and they did. Shah a long way clear. Jade Jones in fifth. In the women's elite, that winning time, 2.17.01 for Katani. De Barber becomes the third fastest with 2.17.56. Mergia took third spot. Very tired athletes, but the British race was won by Ali Dixon just ahead of Charlotte Perdue and Tracy Barlow. Those three should be selected for the World Championship. Sadly, Joe Pavey had to drop out at around 16 miles. The winning time for Daniel Wanjiru, he probably won't care too much about that. Not far outside his personal best. Two hours, five minutes and 48 seconds ahead of Kenanisa Bekele. A debut run, a very good one from Bidan Karoki to take third spot. And Josh Griffiths from Swansea was the first British athlete home and will be selected, we think, to join Callum Hawkins with Robbie Simpson in the World Championship team. They are the elite race headlines from the 2017 Virgin Money London Marathon. Thank you so much to our commentary team of Baroness Tanny Gray, Thompson, Andrew Cotter, Paula Radcliffe, Brendan Foster and Steve Cram. We will, of course, be out with them on the course a little bit later. We'll give them a moment to catch their breath and speak to two uh, very impressive athletes who've had a chance to catch their breaths as well. The winners of the men's and women's elite races, Daniel Wanjiro, Mary Katani. Congratulations to both of you. And Mary, that was a, an incredible race for you to run almost all of it on your own. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to thank God because of this opportunity and also uh, I want to say that it was a great day for me. 
since I learned I ran all the way uh, plus uh, the base mega and then after the base mega dropout I just go along the, the route to the finish line and I thank God because of the energy that he, he granted unto me. He did very, very well. It was the, the world record for a women-only race, of course, as well. And just uh, outside of two set, that magic 217 mark, but to have two women finish under 218 was pretty impressive as well. Yeah, it was uh, really amazing uh, because uh, I was ready uh, to run uh, the best the great time. And of course, uh, we, the two of us, uh, we are fun under 218, so it was a great day to, uh, for, for me today because uh, the weather was uh, good at the beginning when we were starting. It was nice for uh, a world record pace and at least I've done my best and the results uh, which I, I was thinking maybe I will run maybe 217 at 9 or maybe 217 uh, something, but uh, it is really amazing that I have run 217.01. It is when you consider you ran, as you say, most of that race on your own as well. And uh, you were until 30k, you were ahead of Paula Radcliffe's world record as well. So uh, who knows what's in store for you, Mary Katani? But congratulations, Daniel. Uh, your race was also similarly at world record pace for so long as well. Did you expect it to go off at quite the pace it did? Yes, for me, what I can say. In the beginning, the race was very fast because we were inside world record pace uh, and I uh, had prepared for any pace as I was preparing. And uh, you know, as, as the race was very fast, anything can happen. Eh? And uh, we helped each other from the starting. We were talking about how was the pace and uh, the pace we trying to maintain uh, up to the half of the race. And from there, the race was coming tougher and tougher. And uh, we pushed with other guys, and the pacemakers were very nice. They did their work very well. And uh, from there, the sun was coming, and uh, the day was beautiful. But uh, you know, in the race, we don't need that too much sun. So to me, what I can say, the race was good for me. And uh, I had prepared to come and win. Uh, and uh, already I have tested the one record pace. So I know how it, 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 it feels. Eh? Is that important to you to know that you were within world record pace and that you felt comfortable there? Yes, for me, I was very comfortable because uh, I knew the pace we were. And uh, if, we, if we, we were to maintain the pace, we were to run good time, but maybe, you know, there is still next day or next time. Uh, as I can say. So you feel that that world record is coming, it is going to be broken in the near future? Yes, to me, uh, anything is possible, you know, people are still training hand, so anything will happen in future, I can say that. Uh, well, you both look remarkably well, sickeningly well, actually, considering the paces you ran. You look uh, incredibly refreshed already. Uh, go and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and, uh, and spare a moment for those who aren't coming through quite so quickly as you two. And they're getting this blazing sunshine as well. Congratulations to both of you, though, uh, because there are plenty more, thousands more people out there, of course.